Grande parte do nosso planeta é oceano. Dá-lhe a sua característica cor azul. É fonte de vida, de energia, de riqueza. O mundo tem vindo a perceber-se de fatores que afetam estas fontes essenciais e requer ação para garantir a sustentabilidade dos oceanos. O desenvolvimento da economia azul, nomeadamente nas áreas da tecnologia, formação, infraestruturas e regulamentação, dará uma resposta inovadora à importância que os oceanos têm para a vida do nosso planeta. A formação de recursos humanos qualificados é essencial para garantir a sustentabilidade dos transportes marítimos fundamentais para o desenvolvimento da economia azul do futuro. Segundo a Associação Internacional BINCO, em 2025 serão necessários pelo menos 150 mil novos oficiais da Marinha Mercante para responder às necessidades do setor a nível nacional e internacional, o que requer a adoção de medidas que fomentem o aumento da formação de grande qualidade. Nenir. A nossa missão é formar oficiais de marinha mercante para os futuros desafios nacionais e internacionais, bem como outros quadros para o setor marítimo ou portuário. É um objetivo estratégico da escola, que já conta com 96 anos de existência, contribuir para o desenvolvimento da economia azul, através da formação de profissionais altamente qualificados e preparados para as mudanças no chip. A escola rege estritamente pelos altos padrões da Convenção IMO, STCDL e EMSA, e, como tal, promoveu a criação do projeto Mar em Cima, tendo em vista a apetrechar se de um conjunto de modernos simuladores marítimos. Queremos enriquecer a nossa vasta experiência na área da formação marítima através da atualização e modernização da capacidade instalada de simuladores da escola, intercâmbio de experiências de formação, investigação e colaboração com instituições de referência na área marítima e participação em projetos internacionais. A aquisição de equipamentos de simulação de vanguarda é um meio para desenvolver processos de inovação na economia azul e de capacitar os recursos humanos da ENI, com um conhecimento altamente especializado na área marítima, utilizando meios pedagógicos inovadores. O Marine Sim é um projeto desenvolvido em colaboração com duas universidades norueguesas dedicado à aquisição de simuladores marítimos para a formação dos estudantes dos cursos marítimos e requalificação de oficiais de marinha mercante, aliado a ações de melhoria da capacitação em formação e treino marítimo de docentes e estudantes, onde se destaca a realização de seminários, novos cursos e o desenvolvimento de projetos de cooperação, o Marine Sim visa permitir a aquisição de simuladores de vanguarda, nomeadamente Simulador Full Mission, visual de navegação com cartas eletrónicas, é que diz. Simulador Full Mission de instalações propulsoras de navios. Simulador de navegação por radar anticolisão, ARPA. Simulador de treino com modelos de instalações propulsoras de navios. Simulador de treino de embarcações de sobrevivência e salvamento. Simulador de carga e descarga de navios tanque petroleiros, químicos e de gás liquefeito. A ENID, em conjunto com os seus parceiros norueguês NTNU e USN, orgulha-se de fazer parte do programa Crescimento Azul e compromete-se a aumentar a investigação e promover a educação e a informação na área marítima.
grande parte do nosso planeta é oceano. Dá-lhe a sua característica cor azul. É fonte de vida, de energia, de riqueza. O mundo tem vindo a perceber-se de fatores que afetam estas fontes essenciais e requer ação para garantir a sustentabilidade dos oceanos. O desenvolvimento da economia azul, nomeadamente nas áreas da tecnologia, formação, infraestruturas e regulamentação, dará uma resposta inovadora à importância que os oceanos têm para a vida do nosso planeta. A formação de recursos humanos qualificados é essencial para garantir a sustentabilidade dos transportes marítimos fundamentais para o desenvolvimento da economia azul do futuro. Segundo a Associação Internacional BINCO, em 2025 serão necessários pelo menos 150 mil novos oficiais da Marinha Mercante para responder às necessidades do setor a nível nacional e internacional, o que requer a adoção de medidas que fomentem o aumento da formação de grande qualidade. NENID, a nossa missão é formar oficiais de marinha mercante para os futuros desafios nacionais e internacionais, bem como outros quadros para o setor marítimo ou portuário. É um objetivo estratégico da escola, que já conta com 96 anos de existência, contribuir para o desenvolvimento da economia azul, através da formação de profissionais altamente qualificados e preparados para as mudanças no chip. A escola rege estritamente pelos altos padrões da Convenção ilo STCDL e EMSA e, como tal, promoveu a criação do projeto Mar em Cima, tendo em vista a apetrechar se de um conjunto de modernos simuladores marítimos. Queremos enriquecer a nossa vasta experiência na área da formação marítima através da atualização e modernização da capacidade instalada de simuladores da escola, intercâmbio de experiências de formação, investigação e colaboração com instituições de referência na área marítima e participação em projetos internacionais. A aquisição de equipamentos de simulação de vanguarda é um meio para desenvolver processos de inovação na economia azul e de capacitar os recursos humanos da ENI, com um conhecimento altamente especializado na área marítima, utilizando meios pedagógicos e inovadores. O Marine Sim é um projeto desenvolvido em colaboração com duas universidades norueguesas dedicado à aquisição de simuladores marítimos para a formação dos estudantes dos cursos marítimos e requalificação de oficiais de marinha mercante, aliado a ações de melhoria da capacitação em formação e treino marítimo de docentes e estudantes, onde se destaca a realização de seminários, novos cursos e o desenvolvimento de projetos de cooperação, o Marine Sim visa permitir a aquisição de simuladores de vanguarda nomeadamente simulador full mission visual de navegação com cartas eletrónicas é que diz simulador full mission de instalações propulsoras de navios simulador de navegação por radar anticolisão ARPA simulador de treino com modelos de instalações propulsoras de navios simulador de treino de embarcações de sobrevivência e salvamento Simulador de carga e descarga de navios tanque, petroleiros, químicos e de gás liquefeito. A ENID, em conjunto com os seus parceiros norueguês NTNU e USN, orgulha-se de fazer parte do Programa Crescimento Azul e compromete-se a aumentar a investigação e promover a educação e a informação na área marítima.
Hello, good afternoon. Thanks for coming for the Air Grants Conference on Maritime Simulation and Sustainable Shipping. This is a project, is a cooperative uh, organization within the project of Marine Seagoing Forces. And, and we have the cooperation of our dear friends and colleagues from NTNU and USM universities. Uh, let's start with the opening intervention of the Ambassador of Norway in Portugal, Mrs. Tol Ruvik Westberg. It's a pleasure to have you for the first time in our institution and uh, you would like to have some words about the cooperation in between Norway and Portugal, especially in the Air Grants program. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, or... yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, and I'd like to start by saying happy Ocean Day, happy World Ocean Day. Uh, we are actually celebrating that today. So this is very, very convenient. Professor Luis Felipe Batista, President of Scholonautica. Distinguished speakers, representatives from the School of Africa, in Tampa, It's really a great honor to be here today. And uh, to address this conference, uh, organized within the context of the Marine. Marine SIM projects funded by the EEH grants, as already said. We consider this predefined project, supported by the Blue Road program, to be of utmost importance. Not only because it uh, updates the marine training, the technological update of marine training in Portugal, but especially because of the knowledge sharing between our countries that it encompasses for which this event is an example of. In that perspective, I might highlight again the participation from Norway and understand that some of you are here for the very first time. I'm certain that the exchange and the training that we do together uh, is of benefit to the world. <laughs> Strengthen the project, but I'm sure that it also uh, develop and will be valuable for your institutions in the cooperation that you are involved in here. So I'd like to congratulate you all for being in part of this uh, initiative and this program. Given the focus of this conference on sustainable shipping, I would also take this opportunity to share with you some of the Norwegian perspectives about the challenges and opportunities that the shipping industry faces towards the zero emission future, as we will also discuss in the UN Ocean Conference to take place in Lisbon in a few weeks. As we all know, shipping is undoubtedly the most energy efficient way of transporting goods but it needs to do more to reduce its emissions in order to reach the goals set out in the Paris Agreement. Norway is a world leader in the green transition across various shipping segments, but we also believe that the pace of change will still be increased substantially to achieve the goals to agreed upon. With the right approach, we believe we can cut emissions and move towards a zero emission future, and at the same time, create new jobs and business opportunities. In Norway, we are lucky to have strong and innovative maritime clusters and also strong competence at the universities, including them in the clusters, uh, making the Norwegian Coast a laboratory for developing solutions for the future in areas such as bioenergy, wind assisted, uh, wind -assisted propulsion multi fuel user or redropping from LNG to green ammonia. So Norway is committed to uh, continue working on the international agenda to uh, transform the shipping. 
but we are also committed to work bilaterally with other countries to develop more sustainable shipping worldwide. And in Portugal, through the EA grants, Norway supports the Blue Growth Program, as this project is a part of, worth 39 million euros of funding. Its main objective is to increase value creation and sustainable growth in the Portuguese new economy, to increase research and promote education and training in marine and maritime areas. And what is more relevant than to mention this here today? And I just also mentioned that in 2024, Norway and Portugal can uh, celebrate 100 years of uh, research <laughs> in the maritime area. But that brings me back to the Marine Sim project, an excellent example of this cooperation that supported the acquisition of new and advanced marine simulators and is reinforcing the capacity of training officers for the national and international version of Navy. And the future will need you all. I will be looking for the next step of this, the next steps of these uh, projects, and I, I hope to be able to accompany also the results that we will achieve. Uh, I wish you all the best, and again, congratulations to everyone for taking part in this and for being here today. And thank you for inviting me. And I'm looking forward to listening to you. Thank you. We have a small present for this ambassador of Norway, please. This is our medal. Wow. And also, we have a book about the science so we are going to proceed with a slight change in the program. Uh, we are going to start with Vittorio Coil with the presentation logistics and research process and TNU. Hello everyone, and can we have some changes? I'm just leave for some minutes and have the exams at the same time. <laughs> yes, and um, uh, yes, my name is Victoria. I work for NTNU uh, Wallison uh, since uh, 2019. Uh, I came from Ukraine, and um, uh, this is uh, our city. And this is our campus where we work at NTNU, and uh, in front of is Norwegian Maritime Corporate Center. We also have offices there. And we have simulators there. Um, and uh, yeah, this is how it looks like. Very beautiful city. And um, yeah, uh, so I started to work um, uh, for NTNU in 2020. And in 2021, I yeah, got new responsibilities besides teaching and uh, um, research. It was also uh, uh, coordination of the program shipping management. So we have two people, Jan and Sohani, who 
uh, coordinate this program, shipping management. So I decided to put uh, a little bit, uh, some information about our study program because there are some opportunities, possibilities for collaboration. Yeah, so I'm responsible for sustainable maritime logistics and maritime procurement is in autumn and it's really it's sustainable logistics. Uh, we have, in, in general, it's not written program, no written language, but we have already six subjects that we uh, teach in English. So it's procurement, mine, uh, sustainable trade and economics, digital shipping, uh, logistics, uh, in the channel methods, and ship of merchant seminars. And uh, we also have this uh, thing that uh, we have, uh, like, um, those objects that we uh, have for analytics and for shipping together. So we, like, this is for shipping management, but so three, like, show that it's a sea, uh, um, sea law, a maritime uh, organization and, and uh, management, and also um, sustainable chartering and operations. So this is for shipping management and uh, analytics together. And also we have uh, exchange when uh, our students have uh, opportunity to have a bachelor, to write bachelor studies or to have access uh, um, internship. Uh, at the same time, the students can choose to have exchange program so they can go abroad and uh, study their own semester. So they also sometimes use the uh, opportunity to go to Portugal, there are case, cases, yeah. So probably this interest can be interested in that. Uh, yeah, in our program, there is a lot of emphasis on digitalization and sustainability. And the like in my subject, it's sustainability and priority things. Um, but also, we started to, uh, to move in this direction to digitalization. Like, for example, this um, semester, we had uh, this experiments, uh, um, this simulated exercise between nautics and ship management when they worked in simulator and it was quite interesting for students to to see uh, and understand each other like those that have uh, worked in ship and those that will stay in office yes how they can uh, collaborate and communicate because uh, uh, they have to know this um, and um, i could say yeah i told that i here teach logistics but um, i could say that logistics here uh, in Portugal and uh, in uh, Norway, we have different approaches to understanding this job uh, because we look you know, need like from the supply chain perspective, it's more about management, strategical choices, uh, not um, like operational one, not ports. So we don't talk a lot about ports in our subject. So I found that this is some kind of gap that should be solved. And uh, when I decided to show and um, to have this visit to uh, Harbor, uh, Harbor in uh, first term in Odessan, they were so satisfied, they were so inspired and because uh, they didn't see it before. And uh, I understood that we have a lack of the things in our uh, course. Yeah. So this was about program and about teaching duties and uh, now about research. So um, it's more about financial strength, sustainability in maritime supply chain. So if you look on the map, the map we have uh, several maritime clusters, uh, like uh, already we told, and they're quite important uh, in Norway. And for example, Nuria comes down. So where we are, it's here. So we have, we call this the most complete maritime cluster in Norway, because we have everything, all actors that we need. Uh, it's suppliers of equipment, of its shipyards, its uh, ship owners, and its designers. So um, it's more about, uh, and then you see, like, again, port is not included in our maritime cluster because it depends on which activities are the most important in this region. It's connected more to offshore. Yeah, so I will tell this. Um, So I could say that we our Norwegian Maritime Cluster in this area have long history. It started from fisheries, then when we found this oil and gas in Norway, yes, so it started to be more relevant, and uh, it it was more offshore cluster. But after 2013, when we got this uh, price oil price shocks or prices, yes, uh, we remember that it was huge decrease in prices. 
So then this might be faster really soften a lot due to this crisis because offshore activity is decreasing. So also marine power activities is faster than decreasing. So companies started to think which direction. So it was decided who is industry and 2020 Corona lockdowns. So also it was shocks, yes. So from fishery onshore, offshore, Greece, and two, there is a big question, yes. We have to move now. But uh, as I said, it's very important uh, in our region maritime industry maritime cluster because if you look on the export uh, from the region, the region export, so here is this uh, region where we are from, and we see the contribution to our uh, region export is 146 um, um, vineyard crops. Uh, and here, like maritime uh, industry is responsible for almost for 60 percent of this uh, export in this region so quite important so it's very important for economy maritime industry but also it's very very important for environment because because we know that um, there is a standard to decrease co2 and if you look on uh, uh, sources of uh, co2 emissions in Norway so for maritime it's just four percent yeah and uh, there is in our national uh, transport plan in Norway, there is this uh, idea to move uh, uh, from uh, road to sea, the majority of goods that will be transported. And uh, I also did research with the sustainability in shipping, how it's sustainable. So it was part of my research to investigate it. And I proved that it's sustainable <laughs> in Norway because there is this uh, environmental business curve. So if it has this shape, so it means that, yeah, it's sustainable because we reached the point when the CO2 started to go down. Even while increasing, while we are added in the shipping industry, still CO2 started to be increased. So it means that we invest money already in new technologies, increasing CO2. And uh, when it comes to uh, supply chain reactions, uh, uh, how was it impacted uh, our cluster due to offshore prices? So we see uh, this, our actors of maritime uh, cluster in Norway. I told there are four actors in uh, this cluster. And for example, shipping industry, they had 81% of their revenue from offshore industry, from offshore sector. So there are different cost, uh, like sectors that can uh, um, um, create value for different actors like offshore and gas, offshore wind fisheries, aquaculture. So offshore oil and gas industry was responsible for 81% of the value of shipping costs. So you can imagine how uh, this cluster is dependent on uh, this uh, oil and gas industry. Um, and here is the supply chain reaction. So here are uh, actors of maritime clusters, the supply chain of the maritime industry. And here is oil and gas supply chain. So we see how they interconnected between each other. So when this drilling activity is hit due to those uh, prices, uh, prices, so all other actors also solved in my industry. Um, and we can see the consequences because unemployment rate decreased during after 2014. It was huge unemployment in this American cluster. And if you look on um, operation margin, so you see also it was minus, so it was not profitable business at all for all actors of our cluster. And uh, when it comes to financial strengths, I also tried to find out uh, the financial strengths of those actors. So we see, so it went down sharply, uh, like for ship owners, for shipyards. Um, was the same situation. Yeah, so there are a lot of challenges for the industry actually. 2014, collapsing oil prices. 2020, it's COVID lockdowns. As I told you before, it's offshore oil and gas industry was so important for our cluster. Then um, actors started to think differently. They started to think uh, to concentrate more on the um, Cruise industry. So, as you see, they increase the share of activity in the cruise industry. But then COVID happened in 2020. Yes. So, they also, uh, the activities decrease them. 
And um, also another challenge, 2022, yeah. the situation in Europe, yes, in Ukraine. And uh, we know that there are problems with supply chains, uh, um, supply chains, and um, yeah, it's a um, lot of uncertainties due, due to energy things, and also on gas prices. And besides of market shocks, maritime industry, like there is big competition on the international market. And uh, the carbonization in shipping, it's put a lot of stress on the shipping companies to follow those uh, new technologies and so on, so on. So um, energy requirements uh, and it needs money, it needs investment, yes. So um, how to solve the situation, how to survive in those challenges, <laughs> See, uh, those challenges periods, yeah. So the main idea is technology. So innovation is quite important nowadays. It will help us to resist those problems. Because we know that the market industry has a cyclical character, as we noticed. So there is this uh, theory that it involves like, ups and downs. And we can see actually, in, even on this chart, it had ups and strong downs yeah, in this market industry. So how to make, to draw back actually in this situation, not to go down, how to go back and to to bring faster again to growth, yes. So uh, the idea is that technology can uh, contribute here. So it means that combination of entrepreneurship and innovation can help us and to, uh, it's crucial for economic growth, what we had in the cluster. It uh, can contribute to value creation and actually can contribute to GDP. Yes, so it's very important. And, uh, Yeah, so um, what we are uh, looking on nowadays, we think that it's very important to concentrate on those technologies, they are quite important, but still, it's, there are so many uncertainties here, because those new technologies are a new one, and not investigated, we don't know how, say, because it needs lots of money, investment, but we don't know when exactly it can win us for really money, benefits, yes? and what challenges we, we can have when we implement those technologies. For example, there can create different challenges in supply chains, like you know, problems with regulation frameworks. And, and also we noticed uh, already that companies that uh, ask us for research uh, in Norway, they are also wondering um, how we can use those technologies in the most efficient way, because new business models are needed. Because New technologies, it means new organizational models, and it means we have to use them in a way that, in a new way. So, new business models are needed. So, um, without sufficient support of public se sector and uh, without business communication, without uh, entrepreneurs, we can benefit less from innovation and technologies. So, we have to understand how to do it correctly and to avoid those risks. Yeah, so the main idea is to analyze how existing policy instruments create a path towards economic performance in the industry and uh, to explore how those new technologies contribute actually to sustainable value creation. So it's important to, to create those KPIs, how we can see and uh, check how it works on the early stages already, yes? For example, like when it comes to maritime policy, it also should be already some set of indicators that can help us to monitor the implementation of the products. Yeah? And when it comes to companies, they also need a set of indicators that can be internationally applicable, comparable for different companies, different sizes, that we can implement in different countries. Yes? So those indicators can measure the environment and business performance. And, uh, Here we already talked that we have simulators and we have uh, uh, in our um, building a remote operation center. And uh, actually, some companies uh, would like to use it like uh, office, ship owners office, like uh, for remote operations. And they're wondering that it's already uh, existing. And they are wondering how so those new technologies like this remote operation center can be used in the best way. and. Uh, 
uh, green uh, actual area for them and for other actors that will be involved in uh, use of this, this uh, um, remote operation center, like suppliers of uh, equipment, like um, uh, oil and gas industry, how different actors can use those technologies. So it's important to look at new technologies from supply chain perspective. And uh, yeah, so the idea is the following, is to map those uh, environmental impact and business impact, yes? So create uh, this uh, matrix. And uh, there are already some suggestions uh, how we can make some models, sustainable performance analysis have been done. And uh, another is long-term value creation. So uh, the company is wondering when they can get already some benefits from those investments. Where is this transition point? Yes. So also it's possible to measure there are business models that can do this. So we are nowadays working towards those things. Yeah, and uh, so it was everything that I wanted to tell something. And uh, I put a list of my uh, articles uh, for my colleagues. Uh, so probably uh, because we already discussed some possible possible areas uh, for collaboration, and they found yeah, it's the same that we are doing the same articles that I work on. So I respond that it will be quite interesting for my colleagues to find the, the relevant topics because I found that you also work. With those supply chains uh, um, issues and uh, also innovation and technology, it's relevant nowadays. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please. Um, Thank you very much. Next speaker is. Um, I think we can keep Trump, no? Is it me? Uh, I don't know. Can you proceed with Trump? I think you can come. I can go in the place of Victoria to keep the same. Okay, okay. Then we don't get confused. Once oh. Victoria, I will. Okay. We're flexible. <laughs> uh, let's continue with Trump lessons. The presentation will be training courses in prepared from NTN. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. The title is uh, Training Course for Instructors, and uh, particularly the model course 609. So, my talk today is related mostly to the lecturers and instructors, professors at the EDI, but also in, in Ålesund and the USL. So this is related to instructor training. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about the model course, which is a EMO sort of document. In addition, I will more bring up what we actually do at Antianu during these courses. Uh, the thing is that this EMO model course 609, which is training course for instructors, it is mandatory. So all the instructors and lecturers in Norway need to have this as a minimum requirement for being able to teach and train and have lectures at a nautical maritime college, university, or a vocational school. This is the minimum level. Uh, the thing is that the EMO model course, as it is, that's a book, by the way, it's not our model. And I will explain a little bit about that. Now, this is a small sidetrack. Uh, I'm not sure how you, at Enid, utilize these model courses. But the thing is that there is, I would say, almost 100 model courses. Uh, the thing is that they are 
validated by EMOS. They are not manufactured or produced by EMOS. And the fact is that this circular 24, which is issued 16th of June in 2017, is actually stating that the EMO model course can be used, but it's not mandatory to use it. It is not required to use them when preparing and approving training courses. This is directly from EMO. In addition, the validation only means there was no reason found to object to its contents. Now, I'm saying this, and this is going to be discussed during our two days here, but the thing is, once you have your certificate, your STCW certificate, that will document that you are in line with the STCW code. That's the thing. It does, it, it's not actually relevant that you have even model courses. So this is a huge global misunderstanding. You have to be in line with the SCW code, not the evil model courses. Anyway, the train the trainer course at NTNU, the focus is on the instructor, the person in the room. Uh, the, the thing is that this starts already at day one. There's homework, preparations. We have a lot of reflection during these courses. What we try to do is actually to change, or I would not say change, but to give the person at the course something more, to prepare them for better lectures and instructions than before he arrived. The thing is that we only also have it in four days. Uh, going back to the EMO model course, is actually stating 10 days, but that's not the important. Feedback, very important. How can you relate to another person in the classroom? Communication, very important. How to make the best out of a presentation, lecture, how to combine, how to use the means you can, picture, text, audio, sound, how to keep calm, very important, especially when you have, I wouldn't say troubled students, but the thing is that sometimes students can be tough, and then you need to know how to respond. Pedagogy versus andragogy, it could be that this is a new term, I don't know. The thing is, pedagogy means literally uh, learning uh, or leading children or managing children. Andragogy is managing adults. And that's the thing. We are in the borderline. It's not children at our university. You could say they're not really adults, but the thing is they are in somewhere in between. So you can't treat them as children, but you can maybe not treat them as adults. There's a mix here, and we have a focus on that. In addition, I don't know, this is not a bad translation, domination, or rule techniques, but in, in Norway, it's a very good word for it, but again, it's in Northern Norwegian. But the thing is, ruling techniques, domination techniques, uh, you learn to identify them and how to you know, avoid them. Tips and tricks, that's also a part of, as I said, we try to, to really give something back to the person in the room. Breathing is one thing. You can actually calm yourself down with the right methods. The four S's, I'm sorry, it works only in Norwegian. The thing is that this is related to, to speak, to, to how to respond when you have an answer. No, I'm sorry, a question from the audience. So in Norwegian, it's okay. If you are translating it to English, it would be S. Triple A, actually. Uh, C, um, ask, answer, ask. So, this is how to treat a question. 
during a presentation or during a lecture. The brain is also a picture there, and why is that? Well, because the brain is, is all of us, it's, it's, it's me, it's you. Uh, a lot of happened, not in brain surgery, but in brain research. So we know quite a lot more about how we think, how we work, and how we function. Since Edward Musa uh, uh, got the, the uh, Nobel Prize in, in 2014, they have had more than five other major discoveries about the brain. It's, so I'm not saying we use a lot of time, but we use as examples and we try to illustrate. And also the brain with memory, short, short time, working memory, and long-term memory. And we do small exercises uh, to, to, to let them know and identify uh, the differences and how to improve lectures when using these uh, tools and also like problem solving. Now, how do we assess the course participants? Well, we actually film them. So we have everybody on the course needs to prepare an instruction. We use the four step method, and the, the participants on the course needs to prepare for an instruction lecture. And then we use our own uh, participants. What you can see here, the yellow. Is, is the camera so we film the instruction that instruction what you see there is actually uh one participant uh, demonstrating an eyes place but we have had a lot of different things uh i've been witnessed persons demonstrating how to make kebab uh, we have seen how to play the harmonica how to use uh, voltage meter, etc. So it's the thing is that is the method, not uh, what you instruct in. So it's passed or failed uh, criteria. The video it is deleted, of course, but the thing is, it's only the instructor, I me, or my co-instructor. We are always two instructors on these courses, which sees the video together with the course participant. And then you can see something, I would say, the good, the bad, and the ugly. In that sense that, you know, you, if you have bad behaviors or things you normally wouldn't do, well, you see that on video as well. So, but the thing is to correct the responses of the instructor. So what is next at NTNU? Well, we need to have the SEC 610, the EMO model for 610. So why am I talking still about the model courses? The thing is that these two courses, they are not linked to SCCW. These are linked to the instructors in the room. 610 is trained the simulator, trainer, and assessor, and also it is expected that the Norwegian Maritime Authority will require this course as well, especially for everyone involved with simulators. So we are in the de development phase. The instructors at Antenu have the course, because we, we went somewhere else, but now we are developing it ourselves. It will be approved by MMA. And, uh, the course objectives, I'm just briefly mentioning it. TNA, which is training needs analysis. Uh, not that much heard of, but a very useful method for designing courses, designing actually anything related to training. Uh, there's also this design ex execution of exercises and how to assess the participants. So what can we do and what is the way forward? Well, it's up to us, everyone here. We have these two days now. Uh, so we decide, should we have a type of EMO 609 course here, uh, 610? I don't know, as I said, it's, it's, we, we decide this. And, uh, 
let's use those two days to uh, to come up with some examples or projects which we want to do together. So, as the golden rule says, tell what you're going to do, or tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you're told. So now we've been through a little bit about the EMO 609, EMO 610. You've also seen that model courses are not always the model. Uh, you know also what we do at MTNU, especially related to the 609, train the trainer course, as we call it. Uh, and of course, this could be done here as well. It's just a course. Second one, uh, I should want that from the last year, or the Julie, that's like the that So I would like to thank for their support, their advice, and the, their technical opinions. It was very important for, for me, like our decision. So let's proceed with the next speaker, uh, Simon Servan, uh, called the standing position in this community. Please go. Thank you very much. And I say, of course, uh, before you attack Tron, just make sure that the simulators actually work first. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to go a bit more subject specific. Uh, as introduced, my name is Simon Salvag. I'm going to talk about dynamic positioning. So this is just a short brief on the subject of dynamic positioning, what this is. Uh, at the discussion group for navigation, we talked about uh, the possibilities of establishing a dynamic positioning training center here in Lisbon. Uh, this can be done. That is a uh, long and detailed process, which I'm not going to bore you with here. Uh, I'm more going to present the subject as a teaser and hope that this is something that will interest you guys. Uh, so the principle of dynamic positioning. Dynamic positioning is the principle of keeping a vessel in position, but only by the means of active thrust, i.e. using your propellers, your thrusters, to counteract the motions and the forces created upon you by the environment to stay in one fixed position. Uh, position... Um, well, position accuracy around these days, uh, the measured position can be accurate, accurate down to a centimeter level and position keeping accurate on the meter level and even on the decimeter level in uh, perfect conditions. So positioning happens absolute or relative by means of either, either absolute through satellite navigation, hydroacoustic positioning with coordinates or relative to objects such as an oil rig, another vessel, a subsea structure, etc. It is done through uh, position reference systems and sensors that accurately measures the motions of the vessel and uses the thrusters to correct for every, uh, every input measure. So a DP system that is uh, well, in the basis of it, it's a computer system. Uh, most people know it as the DP desk. It comes in many forms by different producers. As you will see here, Norway is uh, 
a predominant producer of these systems, but other ones as well. But DP is so much more than just the DP desk. It's mostly about creating a mathematical model of your vessel and the environment around, which most accurately describes everything that is happening in terms of motion. It is all processed in a computer called the controller, which is a common theme for all the different manufacturers of DP systems. The controller holds the mathematical model. Everything is processed there. It measures the position deviations from the wanted set point, counteracts it by uh, adding the opposing force. There's direct for, uh, feed forward for wind motions, etc. And all of that is used not only to calculate the current position, but also to uh, try to uh, determine the next wave train or the next sort of forces that will act on your vessel. The means used for positioning are for absolute positioning, GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems. Uh, these come in the form of uh, GPS, which we all know, also known as American Navstar. But there are also Russian GLONASS, there's Chinese Baidu, there's uh, European Galileo and many more initiatives. Uh, in India, there's a local initiative that covers India and the surrounding areas, etc. And uh, the night sky is filling up with satellites all the time. We also utilize uh, laser, laser measurement for relative positioning. You can either place a transponder or a reflector on your uh, desired target and position yourselves by means of range bearing measurement with principles of laser or uh, frequency modulated carrier wave, which is a fancy way to say radar. And it would work something like this. Um, there's current progress in the field. There are, for instance, uh, LiDAR sensors coming, which do not require any form of reflectors at all. They just look at the sur surroundings and position you according to what's there. The LiDAR sees it something like this. So, uh, for instance, for the uh, offshore wind industry, placing yourself in a cluster of windmills, you will just position relative to everything that's already there. Uh, and if they're anchored and floating with the current, so will you. Uh, and it will not really matter because you'll be positioned relative with fixed distances to the, uh, to the installations. Uh, DP utilizes hydroacoustics for a lot of stuff. There is HPR positioning uh, either relatively to a uh, remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, or a miniature submarine. There is absolute positioning to transponders on the seabed. You can place them out in a long baseline array, which works a bit like a GPS turned upside down. So the satellites are fixed on the seabed under you, and you position yourself accordingly by measurement of range. Hydroacoustics is also used for, uh, of course, charting the seabed and everything else that we know from navigation. But from a DP perspective, it's, uh, it has many uses. Uh, for instance, uh, drilling rigs use it to measure their riser angle to drilling strings, etc. And there are mechanical systems. Uh, the old fashioned ones is the taut wire seen in the upper left hand corner which is just placing a weight on the bottom and by measurement of the rate of the uh, the length of the wire and the angle you can position yourself relatively to the weight but nowadays we are seeing more and more vessels using gangways to position themselves as uh, so-called walk to work vessels they use uh, they place a gangway on a window for instance and then they they stay there uh, at the exact angle and range.
And normally you don't, you wouldn't use just one of these. You'd combine at least three. Uh, the gold standard is four different systems. They're all weighted depending on frequency and accuracy. And based on that, you get a uh, you get a summarized position, which is your vessel position. And should you lose any of them, the uh, <laughs> effects on your position will not be that detrimental. The jump in position will be small because it's a weighted uh, average of the whole system itself. But you cannot speak about DP without addressing redundancy, because that is at the core of it if you're looking at the class systems. So all the different classification societies have agreed on a standard, which is uh, handled through uh, the Nautical Institute, MINCA. Uh, so we talk about class DP vessels, either one, two, or three. And for two and three, you need redundancy, which basically means that if one component fails, there is another component doing the exact same job that takes over. In a traditional vessel, you have a chain of components, and if one fails, the failure promulgates to the next system, while in a redundant system, the system just carries on as if nothing had happened, and you can safely abort the operation, fix the broken component, and then resume. So to have redundancy in a DP vessel, you need to have mechanical redundancy in your generators, in your switchboards, in your thrusters, at the stern, at the bow. So in this example, there is two 360 degree rotating azimuth thrusters in the, in the stern. There are two bow, thrust, bow tunnel thrusters in the front. Uh, there is an additional forward azimuth thruster, which is just for backup. It's not part of the redundancy concept. And there's redundancy in electrical switchboards. And you can run this with a closed bus tie breaker or an open, and it's a there we go. <laughs> it's a complete split. Uh, and the sides should run completely independent of each other. And you have to carry to keep this thought into this into the design of every system on board. There is liquid redundancy in uh, seawater cooling systems fresh water cooling systems, blue boil systems. So every component has to be separately cooled. It has to be separately lubricated. There has to be separate pumps for everything, separate valves, nothing dependent on the other. Uh, there are separate fuel oil systems for the separate engines. Uh, there's uh, HVAC, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, cooling of the components. You cannot have one common AC plant cooling everything because if it stops, all your computers will overheat and then that's a showstopper. And there's electrical redundancy in the high voltage switchboards, uh, medium voltage, regular voltage, UPSs, so battery systems really, unlimited, uh, uninterruptible power supplies. In your low voltage 24 uh, systems, in your battery banks, everything has to be redundant. And when you drop the system, it'll look, like, it'll look something like this. Everywhere it's split and the systems are working independent of each other. So what we teach with DP is not just the mindset of building a ship, but you have to evolve it into the concept of including DP in design means redundancy, which means basically that once you put a DP on board, all of your vessel becomes DP. And if you forget redundancy in one part, then that single failure has the possibility to stop your whole operation. And according to the rules, we cannot have it. Thank you. So let's proceed with the next speaker, Harald Gerdal, Strategy from NTNU. Thank you. Dear professors, dear colleagues, dear ambassador, 
Thank you for uh, inviting me here to Portugal to be a part of this project. I really look forward to this week for several weeks. Uh, uh, this um, lecture will be about my course, Applied Maritime Strategy, that I teach uh, with another colleague. And it will be about the methodology we use in teaching this course. And I don't know how many, if any of you have attended any teaching in uh, strategy. My background, first of all, I'm a, I'm a teacher, primary school teacher, secondary school teacher, high school teacher, now a university teacher, so I have teaching all grade. All levels. Uh, I jumped out that uh, career and uh, have a, my second career in business administration. And when you teach business administration, you're taught these kind of things, lots of different models with names on them, and they're hard to use when you when you go outside the academical world. Uh, our students at shipping management, they don't want to, they want to get a job, they want to get highly paid. Unfortunately for me, I like these academic models, I like to go into details, but they don't. And when you come out in, the, in this industrial world, this is basically, when people think strategy, they think this model, they think SWOT. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then they found the strategy. So, based on this, from my perspective, narrow uh, strategical uh, work, this is my background on teaching the students, because when they come out, at least in Norwegian uh, companies, this is what they will expect. Uh, in my course, uh, we invite business leaders to come into the classroom. That's the main thing. We start with that before we teach them any theory. Start up, we have uh, five hour uh, sections. In the first hour, we invite a maritime business leader into our class. They, they tell our students how they think about strategy for their company. So the leaders present their work. Our students ask and discuss strategy with these leaders. And then the business leaders leave. And then I talk with the students regarding what's said, what's not said. And then at the end, I teach the student theory. And then they pay attention. I like it. So, First of all, strategy, there's a lot of different definitions. This definition is uh, in Norwegian. And to be honest, I Google translated this this morning, so I hope it makes sense in English as well. But uh, strategy entails a number of plan measures that have been set in advance and that are adopted to achieve specific long-term goals. Often, when we talk strategy, we talk about the short-term goals, but we want our students to think long-term goals, as in five years or ten years, not what's not only what to achieve in the next year. Uh, so, this presentation, I will give about some one of the companies. Oh, that was a bit fast. One uh, company that, ca that has been in our classroom, the company's name is Seacom Marina. They provide complete ISM and safety management systems for all types of vessels. And actually, it's a lecture about this guy in the bottom right corner. Uh, his name is, let's see. Andreas Kiplesum, uh, uh, I had uh, him as my student while studying business administration. 
I was his uh, yeah, teacher in one course. Uh, he's the CEO, CEO of this company. Uh, he got tired of working as an economist. Everyone just coming into him asking, can I have more money? He wanted to use his creativity. He found this uh, software company based on the ISM code. The company was founded in 2004, but nothing really happened until 2015. And as I said, <laughs> talking strategy, we talk long term. For this company, it was nine months. And that was the long term goal for him. Because if he, he didn't have my 200 uh, clients, 200 customers, 200 boats that wanted this software within nine months, then he had to give up. His wife wouldn't give him any, any more than nine months. That's what they have money for. So, and it's so such an experience to kind of have him come into the classroom, talk about all the things he did. This is what the SWOT would look like. Because this, uh, or what we created after he had been here. He's enthusiastic. Uh, he, the company had no money, so uh, he, but he has a master's degree in bootstrapping, which means you have to earn your money before you use them. Uh, and he had friends with white key whitefish shipping companies in Norway. His weaknesses: he had no knowledge of software and I and the ISM code. He had a horrible software. That's a good start, right? And there was no money. Like I said, he had nine months. And then there were different opportunities. None of his uh, competing companies, according to him, uh, had a user-friendly setup. They had bad software, but they had good revenues. So he saw the possibility of making money here. And also trying to get new companies. He only had three months because the other, no, sorry. The other companies had three months binding exits. So when he got the new customer, he had to wait three months before uh, getting paid from them. And then, this, uh, he talked about how he lived in Olsen on a small island called Gudaya. And then if you have been Norwegian, if you have been from Olsen, if you have known Gudaya, uh, and you know the shipping companies there. There's one place to find them all at the same time. Sunday, 11 o'clock, they're all in church. So he went to church, talked to them when the service was finished. And a few days later, he had 10 boats. He had a start. And then he asked, well, where are your friends? Let's see if it comes. Oh, and here we have the entire park. Well, they had friends in Molay, another small place in Norway. He went there and they said, well, if these people trust you, we trust you. Within six weeks, he had 25 votes. And then he went on to Fusnavogin. They said, if the Gude people trust you, if the Mole people trust you, then we trust you. Suddenly he had 80 boats. And then he had a big problem. He had 80 boats, but a bad software. So then he started, had started to make this software. And lucky for him, all these companies had a three months at least exit with the last companies. So he had three months to build this software. And he wanted the software to be better. Uh, and he had taught them, well, maybe we're not the best software, but when you use our software, it will be like being on Facebook. It's supposed to be that easy. So he had a competitive advantage there. And he was able to build the software. Uh, and and in nine months, he actually had, well, it's behind here, but in nine months, he had 235 companies. It became a success story. And uh, those 
we like to have in our classroom. And as the year has gone by, the number of customers is now 1,200. Here's 1,200 books with this software. And being an economist, I don't care about how many customers you have. I care about if you make money. And now it makes money and the company has good revenues. So that's the kind of teaching methodology as the start we use in our courses. We're bringing the business leaders. We make them talk about how they use strategy in their everyday life. And then we put up, up all the models and all the academic things. As I said, I love. So I never know because after they have presented, we go through it together. And I know, don't know which of the strategic models I will uh, teach that day. But that's exciting for me. I like it. It fits with my personality. And within this a semester, we go through all the models. But then the students have uh, real examples to attach when we go through them. I don't have a last, last slide saying thank you so much, but thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, uh, and Professor Eivind, he could not be with us today, but he wants uh, me and Tom to give some gifts to uh, President Luis and President uh, Vito, is, if both of you could come up and uh, receive the gifts from Antony and Professor Eivind. Thank you much. Thanks for being here. Here you are. It, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Well, I just said you. Oh. Uh, a, very, uh, a very old friend. A very old friend. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Offer. So, thanks again. Let's proceed with the, the next speaker. He is just in position. He's Rick Espar. He's called is uh, making a call that is research in, in hybrid education, modeling, simulation, and digital twins, and uh, is from NTNU. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank you, Luis. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually glad that Victoria was first in it because she made a much more official presentation than I would have done. Uh, this is our web browser. Uh, the part of my presentation is actually web-based uh, technologies in engineering. And I, yes, I do have a slide. If this fails, I do have a slide that's more. But the idea is if it's web-based, it should be working on web. So we can be trying how it is. I'll try to be fast. I know that we are a little bit on time. Maybe I go a little bit. But uh, especially with the last two years, I think that if we try to give any hybrid classes until 2019, we would say that we are lazy and etc. But suddenly, then everyone know what means being a hybrid class. Suddenly, and a uh, I was going to say, <laughs> I forgot. To... So, so suddenly, we all know how to put the, the terminology of Zoom, uh, Teams and Zooms. And I'm impressed how this goes from the children, because the children in school, they will be that. And as teachers, even the older teachers, they need to be learned that. So at least they, everyone has their own thing. So I think that this page, the web browser and Google become really for us. So for instance, I hope it works. I don't know how fast this computer. Some of the things that I'm going to show are really advanced in the last level. So maybe if the computer is too slow, I just jump it. But I'll start with good and old, for instance, YouTube. If you, for instance, something that is quite popular now is Digital Twin. If you go with Digital Twin and then can you, for instance, one of the first pages that you have is this YouTube video from us, from our good colleagues here, from our time here. I don't want to put any sound. I hope it's loading. And there's a advertisement, of course. Uh, let's say, 
But um, the idea of digital twin, for instance, is something that I was talking. For instance, we have this right foot uh, without breaking. Let's see. It goes, yes. So this is our this is our campus, and you think half of your colleagues have been there. I think Victoria showed that to you when she showed the room with the people over there. They were in this room. So this is one of the things when we are talking about simulation and hybrid and etc. We are talking about some people in a room having either a class or a training, and other people could be in a virtual mark or in the boat. So it's not hybrid, when I talk about hybrid, it's not hybrid on here between two classes. But this could be something like a training or a digital twin on the boat. And this is a reality now, we are doing now. It's not uh, every time put in place, it's not every day incorporated on the thing, but it is, we do have the systems uh, to do it. And this, I think, that was impressive. I believe that a very few places on the world you can have this full loop closet as we have. This boat that you see there is our boat, belongs to Antanus, uh, that we use over there. So uh, I think we have been investing a lot of time in our resources, everyone here, and who is small parts of this to happen. So we need the training, and we need this part of the training, I think, to what is that, and we need the part of the engineers in the boat to understand the machinery. The engineers like me, I'm an architecture by, by nature. I'm a more theoretical guy. I'm not a practical, practical guy at all. I'm very theoretical. But uh, I believe our biggest, uh, let's say, strength, thank you, Harold, for the strength. And uh, yeah, great, Harold. Uh, in all because we are a little bit smaller campus without the shipping companies there, like it said, we actually have this a uh, little bit more this benefit of having all the parts there. No, we don't want to, to watch a uh, Norwegian blogger. It's okay. Um, I cannot close that one. So, this idea that I can go to the to the YouTube and look for something, suddenly we find a digital twin. This is the idea that I have been working, and that's what uh, uh, Oivind asked me to talk a little bit. So we have been, so remember, this is a big puzzle with lots of pieces. So the pieces that are more connected to the collaboration between us both is, well, we do not have the same maritime cluster that the Norwegians has in Moore and that they have here. So we cannot apply that solutions that they have here for Portugal as well. We need to have which pieces are equivalent, which are the needs that they have here, and that's what we can contribute there, and etc. So for instance, uh, I hope that this is not, I hope I can go to Google and trust more Google, I'm sorry. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm afraid that uh, okay, Google does not go. So for instance, um, I try to go to one of the things that I have here. This is one type of the things that we have been trying to do, for instance, uh, at Centenu. Especially in my case, again, it's web-based. So I cannot just develop something that is there in my, my laptop and no one can use. The things, if they want to be web-based, they need to be browsed, they need to say, Mario, let's do something together. Go with the internet, you need to come here. No, it's impossible. So let's take this case. I think it's the case that the best shows. I hope this computer is, on, is the newest one. So I hope this is strong enough to load. No. Load, it's loading a little bit. Ah, perfect. It's fast. That's computer. Thank you very much. So this is one of the things. Remember that ship that you saw there? This is the same ship, Buneros, in the real environment. I'm not running this from a supercomputer. I'm running this for this. This is not a YouTube video. This is a web-based technology. So this is one of the other extremes that uh, we had it there, that I was commented, that we are able to have today a boat, and this boat is here. We can have views from the captain, for instance, and what the captain sees of the boat, and something like this. And we can even start to, well, maneuver this boat, and this boat starts to be able to see. I need to say, big uh, people from Olesund don't like, but I'm not native from Olesund. My kids are, but this is Trondheim. This is not Olesund in the background. Because Trondheim Comune had a perfect map that we just could plug and play there. In Olesund, we need to cop and do by ourselves. But suddenly, this is not a video game anymore. We do have here 
what Simon presented. We do have here maneuver R and PP model is not so advanced as some. But we do have there a maneuvering model. And yes, we are able to control this chip. So when we are talking about, uh, and then we can see another view of the chip, it's actually working pretty okay. So this is one of the things that I think would be nice to collaborate with Portugal. That's one of the things that we are talking, or any other institution that we are talking. This methods is a part of the hybrid thing that we don't need a maritime cluster. We need the knowledge that we have, and we need the also knowledge that you do, and can be adapted. So that instead of this big EFM here, we can we are able to have a, the coast of Lisbon. Uh, we need to do the modeling, etc. But the, the thing is there. Uh, so the next step with these models that we are doing, do you think that this is another experiment that we have to do? Again, everything online, and I'm very happy that this is working in another computer that's not mine. I mean, this actually brings a lot of it. So this is another thing that we did actually with the University of Tokyo. This is in Sao Paulo, University of Brazil in Sao Paulo, but there's also some cooperation with the University of Tokyo and us at NTNU. This is somehow closes the loop. This is exactly that same technology that we saw before. <laughs> but then we have a physical environment here, and there's a boat. The boat's under waves, and we need to see what happens to the boat under waves. So we are able to see the real boat. This is a camera. We are able to have here. The blue one is the experimental. Blue is what we get it from here. Red is what my student calculated. Starts not so good, and then later on the student calculates a little bit better. And well, because I'm environmental and I'm here, I'm able to come here and I'm able to zoom here and I'm able to even see what the, um, the captain sees. So we actually want to, to, we have not done it yet, but we wanted to combine this model. Let me just put the link this faster. Um, we want to combine this model with some another old model that we have. This is actually developed in 2015, and, uh, which was an expo when we could do design for boats. But we wanted actually to combine this with the view from the bridge. And suddenly we are able to see, let's put a wave heading grid in front of us. And suddenly we are able to see uh, what the captain sees. Again, this is running from a little bit older computer. These are methods that uh, are somehow validated. Let me put this down. We don't need to do the, the mathematical formulation. And that's a good question, actually. How validated is that, really? Oh, but there is water here. A boat will never behave like that. Yes, great. I'm glad that all the captains know that. But we engineers, if we use this formula, that's from Yates and Mansur. It's a formula, it's a paper. We engineers did it. It's actually Jens, it's from uh, Denmark. And Mansoor was from Stanford. They have a very nice paper from 2006 where we based that. When we see the paper, you don't know that. But when you put online, so there is a limit. And actually, to be honest, in this case, the wave is just too big and broke this limit. But you can also make the boat a little bit bigger, and maybe you know, a little bit wider, and then it starts to behave, and the wave a little bit smaller. And then the boat starts to behave. And the, yeah, then the boat starts to behave within the form. Then I think the boat starts to behave a little bit more like a boat. So it looks like a video game, but there's a lot of engineer behind it. And the trick about it, just to finalize my part, because that's the collaboration. I don't need to go to that topic, so the core point, which I'm happy I don't need not to use. The collaboration is we do have. It, from the first video, a real environment, environment on a maritime cluster with this shot me. And I think that we are doing very well. I mean, I'm a little bit biased that I'm working there, so, but I think we do it very well. I, and I'm very happy that we are doing combined. However, I also, especially as a foreigner too, I also see the challenge of it changing this Norwegian environment to any other place. And sometimes it will not work as efficient because of all these elements that Victoria, my colleague, commented in the beginning. So, one of the things that I hope to collaborate, that we can collaborate between and can be in it, is that you do, uh, Mario, you are going to present that later, I suppose. 
you do have your own, for instance, uh, autonomous boat here, and we could then use uh, the digital twin with these technologies. And I think that this will be kind of a win for both of us. We have another case, and also we are able to have uh, some actually new type of uh, research. So just to finalize it again with the uh, did in the beginning, if we are talking about web-based and hybrid, I hope that then everyone can access from Google or something like symbol like this. And I'm very happy that I was afraid that it will not open from your computer. And then I did could not go through this. Uh, but yes, uh, this was developed like seven years ago and yet working fine without breaking. I'm actually impressed. That's it. Was more uh, to hurry up with the time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's proceed with the next speaker. Uh, sorry. Stephen Mullen will talk about research for non secure, no technical skill training, and is coming from the USCM University. <laughs> Great, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, when I first uh, discussed with Per Holberton about the topic, uh, we thought it would be a, a, a good jumping off point to talk about how we utilize research and education and kind of integrate them into our education programs at the bachelor, the master's, at the PhD level, and how that's related to simulation and simulators and simulation based training, uh, and how really. It's focused around our specialty of non technical skills training. So that permeates through our simulator uh, training, but also our simulator based research. So uh, I'm not sure how much time I'll spend on this, but I do want to give a background on my research group and then go into the, the, the integration into the education programs. But at USN, we're about 18,000 students spread over eight campuses, our maritime campus is in uh, Vestfold. Which is where many of the Vikings came from, uh, near Horten and Kongsberg and Sandefjord. Um, we have three research groups, uh, two fairly active on maritime logistics, uh, the training and assessment research group, which I'm representing and speaking on today, and uh, a group related to digitalization and safety. Uh, as you see, uh, I've talked to several of you today about uh, kind of the demographics, if you will, of your department. Uh, we have, uh, it's about similar numbers, I believe, but we have uh, programs on the bachelor's, master's, and PhD level, uh, nautical science, marine engineering, maritime logistics, and more on the business side. And on each one of these levels, there's research integrated, research projects integrated, and also students fed back into these projects and, and, and uh, across different uh, research activities. In terms of the training and assessment research group, my background is human factors. So I'm quite interested in the training side, the assessment side, but also the integration between humans and technology and how it works within kind of the larger organizational system. So in terms of some of our, well, that's not automated, our core topics, yeah, operator skills, uh, operator and seafarer skills, human factors in complex uh, industries, we work within maritime domain, but we also branch out and collaborate with other domains, including the process industry, a little bit with our healthcare. We uh, have a health department where they use simulators for their nursing and, and uh, medical studies. What you can see there is maritime simulators, which is kind of a core topic for today. Uh, quite a bit on assessment and assessment methodologies. The reality is, is we do quite a lot of assessment and quite a lot of it is subjective. So we have several projects and kind of a focus on, well, how can we make it more objective? Not that we'll make it completely objective, but how can we create systems for more objective uh, assessments in our students? Yes, since about 2016, 2017, we've been working with different types of simulators. The traditional simulator, well, really began in the 1970s, 1980s. Full mission simulators became kind of popular and technologically advanced enough in the 1990s and 2000s. We had a really interesting discussion this morning about 
um, training ships. And the institution that I used to work for sold off the training ship in the late 90s and invested that money back into simulators. And that's kind of a classic story that um, appears to be consistent uh, across several training schools I've, uh, I've worked with. Um, so we're getting more into virtual reality, like head-mounted display simulators and the, the potential there, higher accessibility, cloud-based simulation, particularly since COVID, uh, several of the companies, uh, training, uh, training simulator companies have heavily invested in cloud-based simulation. Again, this is reorganizing how we deploy simulation in a training context, opening up new opportunities, and there are pros and there are cons associated with that. And of course, the autonomous shipping, that's, uh, that's less of the focus today. Uh, in terms of major projects, these are all simulator-based projects uh, in some form or another, whether it be related to more of the virtual reality cutting edge or more related to um, traditional simulators, how we integrate them into our um, education programs, how we develop curriculum around different types of simulators, what are they good for, what are they maybe not so good for. And this might look familiar because uh, taking the tour today, you are certainly going to have a, a fantastic facility here uh, in the very near future. So it's very exciting to, uh, to, uh, to take, this, take this tour because we have um, similar simulators, um, similar number of simulators as well on the nautical side and on the process or marine engineering side. And I look at them as tools. You know, these are, in some ways, they're trophies. You know, we can take a tour, we can say, yes, they're fantastic, um, fantastic assets to have, and they, and they are. But how well are they used in practice is the really interesting part. And something that I'm quite interested with the training and assessment research group I work within. And, uh, and um, how to use them in practice efficiently, effectively. If we relate to non-technical skills training, um, I, several of you are familiar with it. Uh, I know it's come up a couple times today. It really is born out of the 1970s, but certainly into the 1980s in the aviation industry, something called crew resource management. And what they were finding in aviation was that a lot of accidents were occurring because of things like communication between pilots and co-pilots. Nothing to do with the technical side, that was just increasing in reliability, but the weaker link was actually these soft skills. So CRM, crew resource management courses were built and developed in the yeah, 1980s, particularly into the 1990s, and it spread out from aviation into aerospace, into nuclear power, um, into process industry, into rail, into the maritime world. And uh, it's quite an interesting area, these non-technical skills or these more soft skills, uh, what has developed and actually become mandatory in the SDCW is bridge resource management, you may have heard of, or engine room resource management. And typical course content relates to things like this, resource management principles, situational awareness, communication, cultural awareness, uh, team experience, leadership styles, assertiveness, etc., etc. So very, very soft uh, skills, if you will. And uh, I just want to briefly introduce one of the projects specifically, which is the EU funded project uh, with what is it, seven, eight partners across, or sorry, 10 partners across seven countries. And it is essentially learning from two different industries. There are approximately half are maritime researchers or uh, industry partners, and approximately half are process industry, mainly in energy, um, academics, and oil and gas and lignite power um, operators. Very different on the outset, but actually what we have in common and what we're learning as we move through this project is that we have a lot more in common because these sharp end operators, whether you're working in a uh, coal fire power plant or in a mining control center or on the bridge of a ship, is that, well, it's at sharp end operations, it's highly complex, it's safety critical, and actually their training programs and their training tools are extremely similar in terms of the work environment, but actually the training simulators that are used. So we're spending a lot of time uh, within our partners' training simulators and learning how they use them. How do they use this static tool? And what we're finding is actually there's some similarities, but 
the approach is quite different. And we've had several comparative studies with our colleagues in Malaysia, with our colleagues, particularly in Germany, about how we deploy this central control room uh, training simulator for a process plant and our bridge or our engine room simulators in terms of the methodology and how we deploy um, training. And there's a several publications that came out of that, and I, I am aware of the time today, so I'm kind of trying to give you an overview of, of um, how we are adapting, how we are also using our simulator, um, our simulators and our education programs as test beds for some of our ideas. So integrating research into our education. And I think that's, that's really been successful because we find out what works. And we also find out what doesn't work, which is very important and very interesting. We won't know unless we try in the real world, in our real world, in an educational context, is with our students and with our education programs in order to, well, uh, maintain relevance in terms of updating our programs, updating our skills, but also the, the efficiency or the efficacy of our curriculum and our curriculum development. So we've done some of these comparative studies between Norwegian and Swedish um, maritime um, training courses, as well as lignite training courses. And this is one particular paper that came out of it. And the approach is quite different in terms of what we found between the typical maritime training course for non-technical skills and the typical process course for non-technical skills of uh, central control room operators. And what is fairly, fairly, um, um, what's the word? It's, it's fairly typical on the maritime side of it, these high fidelity simulator scenarios that are focused on extraordinary typically events catastrophic failure, very high, extreme weather. Um, yeah, and in comparison, what we're finding on the process side and what we're beginning to test is more of these, um, well, simulation exercises and scenarios not based in the extraordinary, not these safety critical catastrophic events, but more on the typical day-to-day -day, um, operations. And we're, they're using the simulator as a platform to test ideas where um, operators come in and say, well, I have this idea or I had this question about startup, a cold startup of a plant, which you don't get to do so often. So what are the differing ways and what are those differing outcomes from this particular exercise? And they use the simulator as a testing ground, not knowing where it's going to go. And also the instructor, not necessarily knowing where it's going to go or having a correct answer because there's not necessarily a correct answer. So it's very participatory in terms of curriculum, in terms of how the training and the scenarios are developed and deployed. It's very student-centered in that case. They're, they're encouraged to explore test potential, which becomes quite interesting from an assessment perspective because how does one assess either subjectively or, as I mentioned before, create some sort of objective framework? These are some of the more interesting quotes from the trainer side, and they may look familiar to uh, Tron and to the NTNU crowd when talking about training the trainer or developing training simulators. So from a trainer, trainer perspective, these are quotes from several of them. I'm like a, con a conductor of an orchestra. Again, if we have a simulator, it's great technology, but it's static. You have to make it come to life, essentially. So that's an analogy that comes up over and over again. I give them the tools to be able to adapt uh, to each other and to the circumstances. Simulators are a tool. It's the participants that create realistic work settings. Those are very interesting, profound type quotes uh, related to training. Again, here, I am not the expert. The trainer is not the expert. They are the ones working with the plant, with the equipment every day. I'm just a facilitator. So again, how do we use the tool of the training simulator? Um, make it come to life, come to life essentially for, for, uh, for training purposes. Coming up on last screen, it's not here, here we are. So in terms of conclusions, if we can call them conclusions, it's really not an end point, a beginning point, um, is this fact of follow-up. I think uh, in, in this analysis, we're failing to follow up on NTS 
um, courses and assessments. More focus on learning from positive examples instead of accidents. That's coming up in the literature over and over and over again. Let's recreate a scenario of an accident because we can learn from mistakes. And there's value in that, but there's also a threat in terms of training biases in these extraordinary events. Um, and moving towards more formalized storytelling or more of the normal work, the safety one versus safety two approach in management. Maybe we don't focus so much on what goes wrong, but let's look at all the success factors that uh, uh, occurred 99.9% .9 of the time in operations. Lack of assessment methods and evaluation tools and this participatory approach, which I find quite interesting and I think is, uh, is being adapted by NTNU and within the Center of Excellent, uh, Excellence Coast, this, this participatory approach of trainee or student empowerment in the content creation or this freedom to explore using simulators as a tool. I think uh, Henrik also mentioned that for more from the naval architecture or engineering side. I think it's a great opportunity because, again, that tool is there to be used and tested out, and there's no consequences uh, in terms of, um, I hate to use the word play, but explore. These are some of the topics related to non-technical skills training that we're working on and we wish to work further on. Um, and I'm not sure if it's interesting for you here in uh, Portugal, uh, but it's certainly relevant for us and, and, and an agenda item, if you will. Certainly the assessment methodologies, as I mentioned, these roles of instructors in different formats too, not just within the classroom, but as we mentioned, cloud-based or hybrid learning structures, um, automation of assessment, for example, non-technical skills content, I think I covered that, and also the use of maritime training simulators for NTS. And the typical as well, we have these technological simulators, but actually we're also working with these companies that are using very rudimentary or basic um, uh, tools, if you will. Lego, for example. We have 30, 20 to 30, um, uh, year experience control room operators who part of their training regime is that they work in pairs and one person is given the Lego instructions and they turn back on and one person is given the Legos and I with the instructions instructions have to explain how to put together a little model plane of 25 pieces not a large Star Wars Lego system or anything, but just something very simple and rudimentary and we're training the skills of communication and clarity. And it has nothing to do with their job, it has nothing to do with complex processes, but actually, can you get the concept across of snapping pieces into the correct place in the correct sequence? It's very interesting. And we're not talking about simulators, we're talking about a Lego kit. Similar, there's a sandbox playground where people are using essentially pieces to map out movements for um, heavy excavators. I've seen similar with azimuths and planning uh, ice breaking activities, for example, and just putting it on a table and moving it around so that a team of two, three, four, five navigators can understand what's going on in a bit more of a, a tactile way. So there's many different alternative ways, there's many different approaches, and I don't think we should poo-poo them because it's not uh, digital, for example, in this digital revolution. Yes, I believe that's it, that was quite a, Broad and quick presentation on simulators and our use of simulators and approach to simulators. Uh, Thank you, Stephen, for a very interesting talk. We are uh, moving for the last speaker of the first panel, came from the University of Spain, more specifically from. Escuela Superior uh, Máquinas. Máquinas y... It belongs to the University of Coruña, where uh, it is an institution that we have a protocol of cooperation and we are establishing new ways of cooperation, especially with a, with a PhD program with our professor, Pedro. Yes. So, Ignacio. Uh, Inácio Fernandes uh, is going to make a talk 
generation of H2 on board LNG vessels. Please. Okay, thank you, Chef. Thank you. Everybody. My name is Ignacio Ares from the University of Catalonia. First of all, I would like to tell to you a little bit of myself. For quite a few years, I was working in several ships. I started in the gas sector, mainly LNG ships, and then I went to I went to work in heavy ships and offshore ships. But therefore, to increase to Therefore, to, in order to, to improve my skills, I, I need to be in contact with some universities. Uh, by the, main way to, the main way to do it is by the PhD program or doctorate program. My small project, the main idea of, course, my, uh, the main idea of my small project is the hydrogen generation of water energy ships. ships. And now I will tell to you a little bit of my project. As we can see in this picture, the demand for LNG will increase by 60, 63% between 2010 and 2030. No current is contemplated here. Now, sure, we're going to change. If the demand decreases as a consequent increase in the flood of LNG ships, 159 new construction are ordered nowadays. It includes energy ships as a consequence, the global warming is affected directly. For this reason, OMI and MARPOL regulate all the rules with the tier, tier, tier limits and global super regulation and ECA. How to comply with the regulation stipulated by the EMO? We, have to differ, we need to differ in two different situations, technical situations. The first one is what the city is in harbor. We have two, three different options, collider, collidering, cliff wells, and we have the cliff. And in the other side is when the ship is sailing with cliff wells and the south coast cliff. Uh, is hydrogen generation a very tracking option? Okay. The chain for the LNG starts in the site supply with the liquefier and storage tank. Then transport with LNG ships. We need to remember minus 163 degrees inside of the tanks for keep the liquefied state. And then at the end, store the tank again, regasification to supply for the customers. For my project, we need to, we need to know the different energy types that exist. There are, uh, there are some energy energies energy with the liquefied plant. The energy produced that tank can be liquefied and return again to the energy to the return again to the tanks. But some of them don't have a required plant. And for this reason, the BOG is supplied, is used to supply the propulsion system. And the test is burned in the, in the GCU gas combustion unit without any, any power use. For this reason, we are going to we are going to focus in on in this plant without the liquefying plant. The energy product generated inside the tanks in a lower tree in a standard LNG ship is the 228 meters cubic per day. In the propulsion system, it's consuming the 168 meters cubic per day, and the rest, 36 meters cubic per day, are burning in the GCU without any power use. For this reason, a propulsion plant is installed, a reforming plant to use these steps and convert to hydrogen. We need to focus on in this part because all the steps convert the hydrogen to use in the propulsion system or storage inside the ship to use in the egg, uh, in the in the restrictive in the restricted areas pollution. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. This is the plant, the plant of the doctor. That this plant. This plant convert the BOG produces the step produces in a reforming in a, in a reforming through the ship the ship plant and then filter in a CO renewable and obtain a 90% of hydrogen. 
But we have uh, we have some hydrogen in the plant. But the problem is how can we store it in the ship? I explained that the, the cargo is minus 163 degrees. For this reason, the option, the main option is install a tank inside the, the main cargo tanks. But how, how system we need to use? We have three different systems and not mature to use now. It's compressed hydrogen tank, liquid hydrogen tank, and cryocompressed tank. Nowadays, we are trying to simulate the system with two different software. Engineering equation solver and aspect, uh, aspect test. Um, the cryocompressive tank look that is the better system that we need to use in this kind of ships. As a, as a conclusion is the efficiency of, the, of this kind of ship need to be improved because as I explained, the 30% of the BOG produces is burning without any power use in the plant. The reforming we need to take we need to take in our minds because hydrogen is a one option that for few clean fuels that we can use inside. The fuel energies can use some of them can use the 70% of hydrogen of natural gas and 30% of hydrogen without any modification. And the cryocompressed tank can be the option that we can use to store the hydrogen. And finally. Clean fuel, hydrogen is the future. Oh, we think that is possible in the future. Okay, thank you for your attention. I need really short, but the time is. Uh, so, and this this concludes the first panel. Uh, we'll have now a short period for a coffee break. So please. In the lobby, we have the coffee break for wants to have a coffee. Thank you for your attention. We'll start in 15 minutes. Thank you.
which is called current status of any projects in this panel we are uh, uh, watching talks of our teachers that are developing projects in cooperation with other institutions so the first speaker is john costa robotic sale in iot network john please Good afternoon, thank you for being here. And thank you also for the lovely time that we are in Alison last 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 month. Bring a microphone. Yeah, uh, where is the microphone? <laughs> in in, in Alison and uh, and let me present some of some of the ideas that uh, maybe we can cooperate with in the future. Um, what what I'm, what I'm talking about is about robotic, robotic sale in uh, IoT network. Um, this uh, this means that we have we, we, we have started with a, with a small project uh, by by invitation of our uh, our navy in 2019 um, by the end of the year. Uh, and they told us, well, can you can you participate in a in a regatta, a small vessel regatta? Uh, so we, we are talking about small vessels like this, one meter twenty something, like that. and we have nothing. We still have nothing today. But nevertheless, nevertheless, um, we, we presented this uh, this idea first in a. In an academic perspective, we can have students working on this. We can have students developing some some of these models that uh, later on will will be involved in the, in the bigger bigger systems. But we we are also seeing an opportunity for other areas with this kind of technologies and with this kind of vessels. So let's let's. Give an idea about, <laughs> about, about this. Um, so, let me present you just briefly the main objectives architecture, energy that, that we are saving by using a, a um, mission management, communication sensors, and give you just small conclusions about this. So, the main argument is the low cost, low cost vessel to perform low, low operation based <laughs> mission so <clears throat> if we are talking about um, such a such a small uh, independent vessels we can have a lot of them we can have several uh, communicating with each other with with smaller solutions with low cost solutions this can be inexpensive okay so uh, this can be used for Monitoring, surveillance, uh, maritime safety, um, environmental protection. Uh, this can be used as a mesh application, which is global monitoring for environment security. So these autonomous vehicles can also um, have um, <clears throat> different scientific payloads, different models according with their missions um, and uh, and the the main the main issue here and uh, that we think we have innovation is to use iot in a, in such a network we are used to 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 see internet of things in, in land in house applications in industry but we never seen this in sea okay so maybe we have innovation here. So this can be used for um, for coverage of our exclusive economic zone. Uh, this is energy saving. This is sustainable, and this is an ecological solution. Okay. So uh, why because the principal use um, wind energy to sell and solar energy to power supply. Uh, the payloads. So, so the the system 
should have uh, should they have uh, sensors or <laughs> sensors um, the management of the dual system and the management of each vessel should have a mission manager module uh, the communications can be very simple by using uh, um, this innovative concept which which we, we have called cell iot network uh, which means using iot on 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 the ocean on sea with the bigger coverage um, and these vessels these robotic cells can can use a mesh network of course in iot <laughs> mesh network but some of the vessels can also have a gateway to 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 interchange to to communicate to uh, to to land and to other systems okay like for instance um satellite or, or gsm gsm now uh, or other other communication mean so uh, on the on the energy we will use solar power supply and uh, and uh, um, the wind wind and ocean currents to to move to move the, the, the vessels okay so on the on the energy uh, basically we will use um to 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 move a battery or 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 full and this autonomous autonomous selling boat takes advantage of winds and, and oceans uh, and currents on, on on the on the ocean and basically will control the the sailboat as a as a robotic cell the rudder and the and the control mission can control control the the system okay. so Uh, so the mission, the mission manager um, manages and makes decisions about about uh, all all the all the all the navigation uh, emission according with the direction of wind speed and current, <laughs> and of course according with GPS and and, and image, and of course we also need uh, solar panels too to harvest uh, energy for the systems um, if, a, if a, uh, a mission manager um, needs to to, uh, to have a mission between points a and b it can perform it autonomously and at the end it, it can exchange data to, um, to 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 other system or simply have this start for future for future evaluation so this is the mission manager and the communications can this has a delay the communications can can use of course the the, the iot which which we, we think is innovative in, in this area and to, together with these two to cause some concepts of mesh network and and of course the gateway to to other systems and to exchange <laughs> with other systems for instance if the vessels are or near shore can use uh, wi-fi or can use other systems uh, near near on, on land, of course. so the main sensors that we need for this is a uh, wind direction and speed water current direction and speed because this will allow us to to perform navigation without any cost, without without fuel without expanding uh, fuel um, we need inertial, inertial sensors and of course gps signals or gms signals, as you have said and uh, other related payloads can be uh, of, of several uh, can be very different according with emissions like the actual <coughs> Pressure, salinity, quality, and even a lidar to to perform uh, collision avoidance, for example. And for this, probably we will need a bigger, bigger vessel. So, uh, in conclusions, I, I think we have opportunity of uh, developing uh, 
um, a new way, it's a new, new, new projects like, um, <clears throat> like related with communications, related with autonomous missions, related with uh, monitoring and surveillance uh, um, in a wide area uh, with, with several, several uh, vessels like this. We can also have the opportunity to develop uh, academic data, which is, you can have several groups of students working on the algorithm here and uh, developing new solutions for in the software level uh, and even trying to have new missions. Uh, and of course, we, we have also a, a, a big challenge, which is to develop new kinds of vessels for different missions. Like uh, we can have this small, small sailboat for, for uh, academic regatta, but we can all also have uh, more robust vessels to perform missions of weeks or months at sea with, with strong weather, for example. Um, and uh, this opens also the, the development of uh, uh, sailboats with with a more robust, more resilient construction, for example. Um, so uh, other areas can be search and rescue. Um, uh, there is a, a big potential for developing new sensors for sea uh, in this area. And of course, the areas of, of activity are very, very wide. Uh, safety, surveillance, remote sensing, pollution, agriculture, inspection, and so on. But of course, it's such a big area. Even we don't, if we don't have uh, energy uh, costs, we need to uh, operate with other systems like satellites, satellite constellations like Sentinels from the NASA or so, and to work together with with these uh, with these solutions. So um, this is important to to have uh, to have also different partners. And, uh, we have here some examples of our students on the last regatta in Rex 19. So this is it. Um, I think I have done it in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is Professor Mario Sussão and is make a uh, uh, intervention about USV and Article 1 project. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here to present you a project that are running uh, at uh, in it at our school. The project name uh, City Future. That program, it's not a project; it's a program uh, that we have developed since uh, 2018, and uh, we intend to with this program to develop develop some. And then some no, and managed sort of surface vehicles to develop technologies and implement that technology in robot, maritime robotics research area. Also, with these uh, vessels, with these uh, kind of uh, vehicles, we intend to uh, use external uh, PhD, uh, Bachelor of Science, and Master of, of Science students. To do work, to do them work in, in this uh, kind of uh, boats or vehicles. In particular, we are already uh, perform or create that uh, USB, that unmanned uh, surface vehicle. This vehicle is uh, performed um, totally in in our uh, in our school with collaboration with, with, with other institutions also. And uh, 
we perform uh, we perform this vehicle to study the different the different technology areas like the whole design, the electrical power propulsion. propulsion so in my English is not very good. Uh, the sensor and computed software also. In whole design, uh, we uh, make some specifications, sorry, uh, and uh, with that specification of uh, that payload and the draft, uh, we draw a whole, a catamaran whole configuration uh, with the software, software, CAT software, and after that, that design, we perform the real one, the real one um, boat. Uh, vessel, sorry. Uh, this um, can this uh, photos illustrate uh, all stage of uh, this uh, um, fabrication, the whole fabrication, all construction. Sorry, and uh, uh, after uh, we first have a mold that perform two rules, symmetric rules, then connect that rules. Uh, then put some uh, platforms to receive the electronics and the electrical systems, uh, design a motors uh, fixers, I think it's the word, uh, cover all the the, whole, uh, the holes, and then, then at the next, the final step, it's the catamaran uh, of, uh, construction made. About the electrical uh, power and propulsion, we have two electrical motors, and uh, which give uh, that the 2,245 newt newtons for thrust force, and uh, to achieve that kind uh, of um, the, the electrical power for that, uh, that 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 motors, we have two main batteries with this capacity 120 amperes. Power and will pro uh, have uh, pro uh, provide power with these uh, two batteries. We have to provide power for four hours mission. The microcontroller and software operation, okay, uh, is made by the Raspberry uh, controller or microcontroller. Uh, this is a, a light, more light. It's a microcontroller, but also a microprocessor. Uh, but we call it a microcontroller because it, it, the basic operation is control uh, the systems. The framework of operation is uh, the ROS. It's a robot operation system. It performs uh, all the handling of sharing data between the internal software tasks and the external software the systems. Uh, the sensors and navigation system are all connected to the uh, PC board. This, this PC board uh, is designed to connect all the sensors. I don't, uh, the sensors are, ex are, um, are the voltage sensors, current sensors, temperature sensors, distance sensors, and pumps. This, this, that kind of sensors is to take the water uh, inside of the room in case of, of the water inside. Also, I I am I am you unit and GPS unit uh, to make a navigation uh, operations uh, uh, navigate operations. Uh, this is a, a PCB designed to connect to uh, have all the all the, the sensors uh, attached to the to the microcontroller that the Raspberry to communicate to the our USB, uh, we have uh, several links. We have uh, performed, uh, installed, and uh, developed a uh, radio radio uh, controller, a Wi-Fi link, and <laughs> you can see it there. But there is a few here, uh, image, and also a radio link to achieve more distance uh, control. The the vessel at more at a higher distance. And to external op operate, we developed develop a software, a graphical user interface uh, software that is running in an external uh, system, an external laptop or computer. 
and uh, you can control uh, using a communication link. We can control uh, uh, the face. As actually, uh, the, the final one intention for the final mission is autonomous control. So this is for control, but you can give instruction instructions to set. Uh, uh, to the vessel to send uh, to make a mission to the vessel and put an autonomous away, an autonomous operation with this uh, software. The more important thing of the more important aspect of this uh, construction of this vessel construction is the collaboration. We have uh, inter institutional collaborations. Uh, that's very useful for us uh, to make some uh, bridge with other, other institutions to make uh, projects and uh, uh, with, the, with them. We developed some projects for a final degree uh, uh, Bachelor of Science, sorry. I just, I, don't, I forgot the word. We developed four, uh, we know, the students uh, developed, uh, th not four, three uh, projects. Uh, also, the master degree thesis we have in, in, um, in um, uh, today, not today, at this moment, we, have develop, we are um, working uh, with students, master degree students, in, in his or the, them degree thesis, the BMS, the battery management system autonomous, uh, the, the, BM, the battery management system for our vessel, the electrical powertrain system for our vessel, the, virt the virtualization, this already uh, finished, it's already uh, finished, sorry. And uh, this one is developed, but it's under, under it's almost at the finish way. This, this three over already finished. More will come uh, for the next, the, for the future. The professors, the, uh, is, the other institute is, institutes uh, involved uh, are the, the ESL and EIST. This is our the um, uh, Polytechnical um, uh, School. Uh, at Lisbon, for, for Lisbon, the the professors is, for, is from an informatic department. It's Carlos Gonçalves and Pedro Fazenda, and from inst, uh, is super uh, so higher institution, technical institutional. Uh, Paul Branco and John Fernandes work with us with the master thesis of electrics. Also, in in our house, uh, uh, the ENIT, we uh, we have that team, Mario, Pedro. Rosa and Vito Frank, we have that are, are here with us and help, and they are the main uh, professors uh, that work in this, uh, in this project. Uh, well, one, of the, one of them, me myself, is more electronics. Uh, Pedro Tudor is more uh, IE, I uh, in, uh, in I, 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 <laughs> artificial intelligence. Uh, Rosa is um, a mechanical engineer who formed the whole, all the whole, thanks Rosa. And Vitor Franco also is a mechanical engineer, he's more a uh, designer uh, and uh, our uh, blue for, for the project. Actually, that vessel opens an opportunity, and then this is the opportunity. We intend to develop a digital twin concept for this USV using the vessel.gs or more than that. Uh, and uh, our partner is NTU, NTU, the Intelligent Systems Lab, and which part is uh, uh, working with us, with us to perform that uh, collaboration project. Finally. We have developed a, a, a website, please, can, you can visit to, to, to see the, the, development, the development and the photos from, from, of this development. And this project is all, all the project are, all this project are small are uh, not public, uh, private financial.
Okay, that, that, that's the, the logotypes of that, uh, of the, our, the uh, firms, companies, sorry, the company sponsors. Thank you very much, Mario. Let's continue with the next talk by Professor Pet Teodoro, Swim Biomechanical Analysis. Please. Hi, good evening. Ah, sorry, good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Pedro Tidor. It's a pleasure for us to see you and to meet you once again. So, there is a delay here. So, no, there is a faster delay. So, um, I'm involved in four main projects in this school. I'm involved in Smart Seed, that uh, Rosa will explain after me, in Situ Future, that Mark already explained it. And I'm going to talk about a new project that you are addressing the SWIMU, Swimming Biomechanical Analysis. And we have another project that have already um, get some good results, which is using artificial intelligence for traffic, for maritime traffic control. Okay. The project swimming is it's a concatenation of two, of two concepts, swimming and and an initial sensor. And the main goal is to have these sensors attached to the human body, study the curves that we obtain from, from these sensors and estimate all the metrics, all the possible metrics that we can um, get from those uh, curves. So we have two main goals with this project. One is for science and one is for innovation, because the mindset is always not science, but science being able to do some innovation and some, and some products. So for science, the goal is to have some biomechanical analysis of the swimming in order to understand the trust force performed by a professional swimmer or from a disabled swimmer, and how to improve it. And for innovation, the goal is to produce some wearables, not just as big as these ones, and to be able to sell it in order to, um, to provide to the swimmers a virtual coach. A system that could tell us some feedback about how are you swim and how can we improve. So this is the prototype. We have already done a prototype. Okay, so we have um, a microcontroller with some SD card reader and a national sensor. And in the top right corner, we have our a student of us swimming with, with our wearables. And that's it. It's um, a project that are uh, going somewhere. In order to complement the, the wearables, we have a camera in order to um, capture the swimmer along the 25 meters of our swimming pool. So in order to do that, some of you have, uh, have already being in the, in the in our swimming pool. And in the middle, we have a camera, an eye fish camera, that 
is able to project the original image into a rectangle, which is our uh, with the correct dimensions of our swimming pool. And with this, you can not only track swimmers, but also track the USB and optical one in order to be able to um, autonomously control. The first results. Okay, so since we are using four variables, one for each wrist and one for each elbow, we obtain four characteristic curves. And we are starting studying these curves, but we can see that this initial phase is the push from, from the wall. Then we have this. Then we have a, a swimming phase, a turn phase, and then, sorry, and then the last swimming phase. Sorry, this is a 50 meter run. Okay. And here so you can see a stroke print. That's it. We are starting, but we are getting some. Finally, as an extra, we have the we have the, the project for the traffic control using artificial intelligence. This has already um, give some good results. We have uh, achieved 94% in order to um, detect and classify all these different types of, of vessels. And this is was and this was done in our in our building facing our river. Okay. This is a very good result. Okay. Thank you. Let's continue to the next talk. Uh, Smart Sea Project by Rosa Marat. Good afternoon, not good evening. Uh, I will present a short presentation about uh, the Smart Sea Erasmus project. This is a, uh, an Erasmus Plus project that is a master degree postgraduate uh, uh, degree. So the Smart Sea name means that uh, the serving and maritime Internet of Things education. So the, there was a motivation for this project that is uh, over the past five years or more, the Internet of Things has grown rapidly, founding applications in several sectors. So uh, like the maritime sector and the large shipping corporations are already investing heavily in the IoT solutions with several adventures like uh, optimization of procedures, uh, energy efficiency, transparency, maintenance and safety, and also the reduction of costs and risks. So the IoT applications enable shipping from companies to connect their vessels in one own platform. So allowing data sharing with the corporate ecosystems. To do so, there are main objectives for this project. And the, the real big pro, uh, objective was to develop a master degree course on the mar maritime and service ICT IoT application that will train individuals that are missing in the industry with the necessary skills and knowledge to work in the rising smart maritime and serving industry. So also to develop and advantages an interactive innovative certified master degree course to create an easily deployable course that can be used in the others in the European Union 
educators, and also a master degree course that can follow the BCTS credit system that is also recognition in all of the European Union. So another objective was to offer scholarships and with this project it is possible to offer 40 scholarships like the tuition fees and travel and living possible during some part of the course that is the mobility period. The candidates to this to this master degree course must be uh, engineering, uh, like in the backgrounds of the mechanical engineer or electrical engineer, or etc. The science, like the physics, geometry, computer, and also maritime, maritime sorry, marine and maritime studies, and also economics, but with the engineering background. So. To do so, there are several uh, institutions. Uh, so there is a consortium and a consortium of 12 partners. These partners are uh, six universities from the European Union, two small and medium enterprises, uh, one research uh, center, and three large enterprises. These 12 partners are uh, from 11 countries, like Spain, Slovenia, Greece, Holland, Estonia, Portugal, where we are, Bulgaria, Austria, Romania, Greece, France, and Cyprus. And the main uh, uh, project coordinator, the, 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 the responsible for this uh, project coordinator, is the BCIT group, it's a, a research group from the University of Salamanca in Spain. Uh, from here, from Portugal, we have the NIT staff, and I will start to show you the, the professors who made part of this uh, project. The first one is Professor Miguel Silva, Silva, that was the first project coordinator in the beginning of the project. It started in 2019, and he also made the, the part of the uh, design of one course, that is the Maritime Control System course. So there are several courses in this in this master degree, and this is one of, of this uh, this course. Other professor who made the, also the part of this course of the same course, the maritime control systems, is Professor Pedro Tudors, as you know already. He's also a uh, main part of this uh, this uh, course, and he also teaches or lecture in the course. Uh, Professor Mario Susão, as you also already know, also is uh, he also gave a, a lecture and he also made the curriculum design of the data acquisition and sensor scores. So another one. And uh, Professor João Corente, uh, he's a, a marine uh, engineer in the field of marine safety, and he also made part of the the course that is safety of on work. At work on sea. Professor Bell Simons is another one, another professor from our school, and he made part of the curriculum design. He didn't give lecture, but he made the curriculum design of geographic information systems. And Professor Anna Pimentel, he, she's a lawyer and she's a postgraduate in maritime, maritime law, and he also produced the Pigment design, the teaching material, and she lectures the maritime legal arrangement. And me, myself, I am Rosa Mara, and I'm the pro project coordinator since 2000. So, the project. The project begins in uh, 2019, and it, it will end in uh, 2022. It's almost finishing. So, in October 22, it will finish. And uh, it had 60 ECTS and 1500 hours of lectures. So the lectures are eight months lectures. They also <laughs> are already started and they are already finished. So now we are in, the, in June and the, the, the lectures has finished in the May of, uh, of 22. Uh, uh, also, after the lectures, 
there is one month of two periods of mobility exchange. So the students from one institution go to the other institution to, to, give, to, to have some labs, and after that, in uh, the final second mobility, the other students go to the other institution to give the other lectures. After that, in the finish, they will have one month of industrial placement. So they go to, to four different industrial placements to reduce <laughs> the industrial uh, applications of what they have learned during all the, the lectures. So the main targets of, uh, of this uh, project, the main groups are the students, as we all, all know, but also industrial place partners, academics, the scientific community, the European startups, and also smart and medium enterprises. Uh, to, to, to have the, the, we have constructed an e-learning platform where we all uh, store the teaching materials to, to give to, to the students, to assign tasks, to monitor the progress of the students, evaluate the students, the participants, connect the experiments uh, with the demonstrators, to provide deployment and mobility information, and also act as a remote teaching aid. This platform is shown in, in here, you can see this picture, and it is uh, all, all even now it's, it's working with the student because the project has not finished yet. Uh, there is 24 courses in this uh, project, uh, 12 plus 12 in the first term and second term, and uh, the red ones are the, from the NE staff, and all the, the course, uh, all the, the master degree is given in English, but we, it has all, also language courses of the two institutions in Slovenia and in Greece, for, for them to, to immerse in local cultures. So there we also uh, after the courses we have also the laboratories. So these courses, the, the courses, the, the twenty four courses were given in class in presence in web via web. Uh, for example, as in Portugal, we give the, the lectures in via online, and also the, the laboratory experiments. And the laboratory experiments are various from the NI lab view training, data acquisition, IoT classroom, hub, the lightweight materialized composites, the data processing, intermediate project and developing tool demonstrator. These two intermediate projects and tool, the tool demonstrator were the, the, the finished ones. So the mobility periods, there were two mobility periods. So the, the, the students from the University of Aigu, that is in Greece, go to the FMTS University that is in Slovenia. And the, the students from Slovenia stay there, so they all go at the same time to one institution. After that, in the, another 14 days, they change and go to the, the people, the students from Slovenia, goes to Greece. For what? To participate in lectures also and in laboratories that they don't have in each university, and also to develop the IoT and the under, underwater drone system, the HOP. And then final, they have the, the industrial placement that they, they are finishing now. And uh, in the four uh, industrial placement, they, to install the development HOP and to, to develop the IoT demonstrator. The, these four industrial partners, they are the large enterprises. They are the Rina, the Ocean, the NASA, and Nush enterprises. And after this, they will finish the master degree with uh, a thesis. They have to, to, to produce a thesis and they have to finish until October 22. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Let's continue with the next talk. Uh, safer simulation of sea accidents for effective response by Professor Tiakirio.
Well, good afternoon to everybody. My name is Tiago Hill. I am as a former deck officer for 10 years in passenger ships. Uh, lately, the last four years, expedition vessels. They were very interested in terms that they can, uh, the, the last four years was like a composition of all the time that I passed at sea. Why? Because it gave, gave me a different perspective of uh, a whole new industry that we have now at the moment. As everybody knows, the expedition vessels now are is a niche market everywhere and it imposes several risks in terms of safety. This project opened a little bit that window because we are able to develop a tool that can give some answers to this challenging industry in terms of navigation and the general and the general and the safety as a whole concept. You may ask, sea safer simulation of sea accidents for effective responses. It sounds pretty common what these guys are inventing here. Uh, the application of sea accidents, as mentioned by Mr. Steven, is pretty regular. It's a useful tool that we can use to develop in simulators to give proper answers. But with this project, we are aiming for something different and different answers in terms of how can we adapt the sea accidents in terms of uh, knowledge. So what we can bring, what we can take from those accidents, especially to the school, at the earlier stages of uh, the school. So this is a project. Oops, we have a small delay. Yeah. So, um, the CCV project, it will develop a range of simulated scenarios using accident and incident reports in an innovative online platform for training seafarers that operate and work in various disciplines. Uh, the, one of the main objectives of the CCFR is to... There are some difficulties, as we know, in the, as, as you can see there in the maritime education and training, we, we have conducted the questionnaire and a research, and we have noticed that not only the cadets, you know, all the professionals at sea, it's a common agreement that the simulation, the practice side, or through all the learning process, we have uh, a gap in that part of teaching. This project, one of the main objectives is to bring the accident and incident investigations as a learning tool in the earlier stages, not only on the early stages of a learning process while we are at school, but also for uh, people that is already, I mean, seafarers that are already working at sea. And not only tech department, engine department, but also that involves all the stakeholders uh, involved in the maritime industry. So the benefits of SeaSafer is raising seafarers' awareness on the accidents that could take place in the vessel, easily accessible with lesser cost compared to conventional full mission simulators. As we know, they are complex tools and they are not uh, uh, reachable to everybody. The SeaSafer project, one of the main targets is to uh, evolve through an e-learning tool where everybody can have access, not only at the learning institutions, but also we are on board and we can get access to that tool. Uh, we also are aiming for a certification option. That is something that we are looking forward. Of course, that is not so easy, but uh, to get, but it's something that we can press and we can have an outcome in the certification process. And of course, to be recognized by some of the companies Maybe they know that this tool exists and maybe they can request the certification or at least a small formation familiarization with the tool and with the positive outcomes that we can have from it. So with the partners, we are six, the Lithuania, the Lithuanian Maritime Academy, they are the Contract and contract the Maritime Innovators is a Turkish company which is the works for Lithuanian Maritime Academy. It's not a Maritime Academy. This is 
a subcontractor from LMA, as we call it, Lithuanian Maritime Academy. The intellectual output mainly comes from Romania by the Mircea Salvatore Naval Academy, the Bulgaria NVNA, and Portugal, of course, as National Maritime College, and the Greece IDEC. They help with all the formal parts and the e development, e assessment tools. Those the, from Greece are responsible for that. The project name, as you know, CSAFER, this is the budget the start date was mostly one year ago, one, and two, uh, one, one year and two months ago. The total duration is 24 months, so the end date is April of the next year. But due to the complexity of the tool that we are trying to create, we assume that maybe we can extend it for one or two months. It's something which is now on the table because, as I will tell you, and you will see uh, later on, it's a little bit difficult to create really something out of the box. So uh, the project approach is a report on identification of training needs as all the projects, first of all, of course, we have to identify the training needs when we are leading. We did the questionnaire. We have two very interesting questions, which uh, later on I will show to you, and that you will see how important is the simulation and integration of new simulators, especially now at the school at this moment, and how can we learn and can we develop the tool. Uh, now, at the present moment, we are there at the middle development of methods and methodologies. This is very difficult. What is the way to go? How we are going to, once again, how we are going to applicate the real accident in terms of knowledge and how can we learn from it? Short-term impacts are a platform to raise seafarers safety awareness. Safety awareness, uh, and uh, it's not a new concept, in my opinion, personal opinion, and as a conclusion of the questionnaire, the safety awareness, conscious, uh, conscious, uh, conscious, conscious uh, awareness, it's very important nowadays, and it's one of the main items which are identified as a great cause of the accidents at sea. A platform, as I said to you, to train worldwide seafarers for a safer industry certification option, recognition, long-term impacts are wider acceptance for the training pro program and their constitute parts across Europe and possibly worldwide. Lex accidents, safer seas and ports, that's what we are all looking for. More competent and conscious seafarers. This is very important because we all know that at sea, the competency and the consciousness, it's something that nowadays we are involved in so much paperwork, in so... Uh, in a high workload that the safety caution sometimes even is put, is put aside, as we all know. Uh, so, as I was telling to you, these two interest questions which I wanted to bring here to the audience. The task 1.2, we divided in intellectual output, one intellectual output, two. This, we have finished just this task few months ago that we were at Greece and we discussed this report. The conclusion was made together with us and the Greek uh, IDEC institution. The goal of this report is to analyze the analyze of the results of the survey that CIFAR projects partners held in task 1.2. It was a questionnaire of 12 questions and they were created and issued to identify and validate the need analysis and training education of navigation and engine officers. It was open to uh, as we you know, to uh, as I've told you, to the education, uh, to the engine and deck officers, and the questionnaire was distributed to all vet centers, shipping companies, deck engine officers, port authorities, and social partners. Uh, so this is a general view of what was the questionnaire. As you can see, it was 314, 314 participants, several countries, as we have it there, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Greece, Lithuania, Peru, Portugal, Romania, Spain, and Switzerland, and from uh, all uh, parts of the maritime sector. For you to have just an idea, teacher trainers, one four, manager, employee, shipping company, 11, state officers, eight, chief officer, three, deck officer, two, deck department, uh, the greatest part that fill up the question, and 91, Whereas deck cadets, you can see 91. Romania, uh, they had, as you can see there, 106 questionnaires. We, Portugal, 42, who were the second, 
Romania, they have a big institution and they uh, have a massive participation here uh, in the questionnaire and the cadets uh, from their side. Officer, second engineer, engine department 29, engine cadet 35, others, a total of 314. This is the first question. This question, uh, it's very interesting because we asked the, um, the we asked the audience to give us from one to eight, which they consider the, uh, the cause that led to an accident. So what are the most likely from root cause from the first till the eight? And you can see, I totally agree with the last. As you can see, it, I marked them in red. Where come first the distraction fatigue maybe emphasizes the workload that we have nowadays in the industry. And secondly, we have the situational awareness, what I was telling the situational awareness is something very complex and that definitely in the simulation we can insist and we can uh, uh, bring into training and to so, so the second question second question um, it's very important to understand how do we need really the marine uh, uh, the integration of simulation in the training process as you can see 82.4, 82.4% of the interviewed people, they agree that in the earlier stage of the formation at the Nautical Academy, it's very important to integrate the simulation process. As you can see, consider the previous questions, the question that you just asked me, and what you have chosen as the most likely root causes, would you have favor for seafarers to confront these root causes in a simulation? So to confront in a simulation environment, in this case, with the distraction fatigue, situational awareness. How important this is? So do you think that they will make a significant difference in the progression of a future? And you can see that there is a massive response, 80, 82 decimal 4% of professionals in the maritime field that they feel that confronting seafarers during their initial training in a simulator environment with a major root of cause accidents will make a significant difference in the progression of future accidents. On the other hand, 12% had no opinion and 5.5% of the professionals participating in the survey replied negatively in this question. So these two questions are very important. It's some of the fields that we are bringing to the project. We are trying to find cases that apply uh, in the whole content of that case in terms of situation awareness, distraction, fatigue. Those things are difficult to recreate in a simulation environment. I cannot leave the students three, four days, or even one, two months of embarkation, and then the accident comes at the third month of embarkation. So that's our third month of contract. That it's very difficult. But we are trying to arrange and to create the conditions where you can really not recreate totally the scenario, but uh, take out the best of it and to apply to the simulation process in terms of training. So from the whole questionnaire, this is the conclusion. The need for extra simulator time specifically devoted to past incidents and accidents is apparent, even though we see that the difference between the inexperienced cadets and the experienced professionals, because we divide the questionnaire in cadets and the professionals, this difference converges in the end on the same result. So the distraction fatigue and the situational awareness was a common agreement. That maritime training is not in the level needed to safeguard safety. Many things need to change in order to achieve this goal, and especially at the, tri at the training institutes. That is, has been identified. So the intellectual output, as I've said to you, it divides in two. At this moment, we are ending the first phase. Intellectual output 1.1 is the training needs. They were identified. The second one, when one put generic questionnaire, the third, the knowledge base, which comes with the conclusion. And now we have just finished the methods and methodologies and we are implementing them at the simulation process and we are seeing how, we act, how it comes and what can we do with the outcome that comes from the simulation. That is the task that has been distributed now to all the partners, but it's not so easy. Now at the moment we are implementing that in the engine, also in the deck department, deck simulation and definitely, of course, the new simulators will bring a whole different capacity to implement these tools. The intellectual output, 
that is the e-assessment tool that is uh, uh, the next phase after we um, create 10 scenarios. The target for each partner at the moment is to replicate 10 scenarios to see how they come from, what can we do with them, and how can we give to for each phase uh, or, um, how, how do we say, general um, uh, we say we implement the, the 10 cases but because one of the main ideas is to standardize the cases. It's very difficult, as you know, in simulation. Not all of us, we have the same simulator, we don't have the same ship, we don't have the same type of engine, the same type of crew, but that is a different story that we can replicate more or less. But to standardize the e-assessment tool, that it's very difficult. And at the moment, we are actually struggling a little bit that we are aiming for the installation of the new simulators because we believe that can give uh, some nice answers in that in that in, that, uh, in those terms. And that's it. This is the CSF. We have a website. My contact is over there. Jack Hello, Bob, and not the doctor. Yes. Thank you. Very much, Professor Jackie Let's con let's continue to the next call. New energy pools for LNG tankers by Professor Pedro Almeida and Professor Sandrina Pereira. Thank you, so, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sandrina Pereira, and my colleague is uh, Pedro Almeida. Um, we are both professors of the engineering department, and uh, we are starting now to work on the new research uh, topic here in uh, ENIT, related to the use of uh, new energy fuels in the vessels, namely in our case in LNG, LNG tankers. Why LNG tankers? Because as all of you know, uh, the, the, the world of vessels is, uh, is big and uh, we need to, to focus our research in a, a type of vessels. And uh, uh, Pedro Almeida started in the, his master thesis working in this uh, type of vessels and we decided to continue. So, starting now with uh, our presentation, uh, why we need new energy foods? We need uh, due to environmental issues, due to economic issues, and also due to security of energy supply issues. As you know, we have uh, big problems due to the greenhouse gas emissions, big environmental, environmental problems, um, fossil fuels uh, represent a high cost for countries like Portugal uh, and for many countries if in Europe. And we have a big problem regarding security of energy supplies. Uh, this problem is uh, a real problem now, uh, as uh, you know. So we need to change. We need to change something um, regarding global warming. Uh, all, of, all of you uh, see the news and uh, we have uh, big uh, problems uh, in the different uh, points of the world and the problems and the consequences of the, the greenhouse uh, gas emissions are not only in the developed countries, are also in the undeveloped countries and uh, they don't emit uh, greenhouse gas emissions like us, like the, all the developing countries. Um, why uh, we are now looking to international uh, shipping, why we are now looking to vessels, why we are now looking to shipping, because we are in the school in this area and we need to, to develop work in this area, we need to develop research in this area. Uh, another point is uh, all politicians are, um, have in, the, in their agenda this, uh, this point, the, 
the global warming and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, namely IMO, uh, as you know, launched um, a goal to reduce at least 15% of greenhouse gas emissions until 2015. So is um, a big uh, goal and I hope we can um, reach uh, this goal. Uh, they they approved or they they give us uh, some measures and one of the measures is uh, liquefied natural gas liquefied natural gas will be we think a way uh, during many years will be used um, uh, by many vessels and not only many vessels will be used in the in the cars will be used as uh, an energy fuel, as uh, an important energy fuel, uh, and will be used as a way to reach or to go to other uh, energy fuels. So now I think that I was to you always. <laughs> why, why LNG? LNG is, is a fossil fuel. Yes, it's true, but uh, it reduces emissions. Um, it can be uh, it can be as a bridge uh, to other fuel types, namely hydrogen, namely ammonia. Um, we know that we cannot change all the world. We cannot change all the um, the, the energy resource, uh, and we will continue to use the fossil fuels and. Uh, uh, natural gas can be uh, can have here an important uh, role. We know that uh, there is uh, still in process of building infrastructure for buckling operation in most parts, but uh, we have uh, many structures at uh, for uh, natural gas. I think that now I will pass the floor to Pedro. <laughs> Uh, so, why uh, LNG tankers and why is it uh, still a niche for uh, steam propulsion? We use steam turbines for, for propulsion. Well, uh, it's in the process of uh, being uh, exchanged for, for other types, like uh, diesel engines burning also uh, liquefied natural gas. Um, but uh, it, uh, it is still uh, an easy way to use the oil of gas that naturally occurs inside. Uh, a tank uh, on, on, on these vessels. Anyway, um, 34% why natural, why natural gas must be shipped from one side to the other of the world. 34% uh, of the total energy consumed comes from natural gas. There are around 500, 570 uh, LNG tankers uh, going around the world, the world trading uh, this resource. And 41% of them is still use uh, steam turbines. Uh, yes, there are new technologies on diesel engines to, that allow them to use not only diesel and heavy fuel oil, but also uh, LNG. Uh, but it's still, in my opinion, maybe a transitional phase uh, to use other type of fuel. Why uh, do they use the, this kind of fuel, like LNG? Well, they transport like. Uh, the, the LNG at very low temperatures and it naturally boils inside the tanks. So we need to, use, to, to make something of uh, that gas that naturally boils, use it in the propulsion plant. Uh, burn on boilers uh, with uh, steam turbine propulsion or uh, in new diesel engines which uh, also permit that. But uh, is it possible to, to use hydrogen as well? Well, yes. Uh, in acid that was a year, an hour ago speaking. Uh, not all of the bulk of the bulk of gas is used, and some of them can be transformed in hydrogen and used as well. Why hydrogen? It, uh, it, it's the most abundant uh, element uh, on our planet, but still represents only less than 2% of the energy consumption uh, in Europe. Uh, it's mainly produced uh, in industrial uh, Settlements uh, by natural gas uh, in, a, in a form that is not green to the environment. Uh, it, we need to separate the carbon from the hydrogen, and what do we do with the carbon? Uh, 
Um, nowadays, most of it goes to the atmosphere. Of course, there are technologies to capture that carbon. I will speak about them a little later on. Um, apart from that, it, it, can not, it can be burned as well, of course, it's a fuel, uh, but uh, it can, use, can be used in fuel cells. Uh, and the, the outcome of using hydrogen and oxygen, of course, in fuel cells, the outcome is what? And it produces electricity, so it's very clear. Well, the colors of hydrogen. Uh, nowadays, uh, a new color of hydrogen. This is a little slow. Uh, the color of hydrogen uh, appears one uh, every single day, almost. Uh, the green hydrogen. Everybody speaks about green hydrogen. Um, it's basically the production of hydrogen uh, using electrolysis of water, a technology that we know uh, for, for a long time, uh, but. The electricity uh, needed for electrolysis comes from uh, renewable, renewable, wind, solar, you name it. Blue and, and gray hydrogen, the process is the same, still reforming. Uh, you get uh, natural gas or other fossil fuel, most of it is natural gas. The only difference is that you capture, on one, you capture the CO2 and maybe you can use it for something else. The gray hydrogen just release it to the atmosphere. The purple or pink hydrogen, um, it's also electrolysis, but uh, the electricity needed doesn't come from wind or solar, it comes from nuclear power. We already uh, produce electricity on nuclear power in, to some degree, to a big degree, and use, can use it to produce hydrogen. Black hydrogen from coal, very um, non, completely non-renewable and, um, and very pollutant. The turquoise, uh, it's more, more or less the same thing as blue, but uh, you capture the CO2 and uh, um, produce solid carbon with it. Well, the white, you can have some industrial process that emits uh, hydrogen by, by some degree and can capture it and use it afterwards. There are more colors of, I believe there will be more colors in the near future. Everybody will think of a new color for uh, to color hydrogen and uh, and make them work. Well, considering storage technologies, uh, these three main ones we can uh, are used, uh, compressed at ambient temperature. The, the hydrogen will uh, liquefy at around 700 to 1000 bar. It's very high pressures. The materials needed for such uh, vessels um, are extremely. Uh, difficult to produce and difficult to produce like tankers to uh, be able to withstand these pressures. And then the other spectrum completely liquefied at 20, 20 Kelvin, very low temperature, atmospheric pressure. Well, compressed and liquefied is an halfway point uh, between compressed and liquefied, not so low temperatures and not so high pressures. But uh, new, technologies, the, the new technologies are being developed to, um, to storage hydrogen. Adsorption, this uh, uh, is a, only the, like the addition of molecules, in this case of, of a substance, in this case hydrogen, to a, a surface of a liquid or a solid. Uh, Carbon-based materials, or, for example, can be used for that. And then absorption by metal hydrates or chemical storage, basically some kind of element that can absorb hydrogen in a certain rate and then release it when needed. So, but, well, metal hydrates, they do store a good quantity of hydrogen, but release it really very slow and absorb very slow. So, can be used for some things, but not for the others. Uh, chemical storage, ammonia is uh, uh, one of the elements that are is being studied to uh, capture hydrogen and then release it at uh, uh, with a, a better density gravimetric density we can absorb more hydrogen than metal hydrates but all of this is still being on the early stages of development there's not uh, big uh, there's research of course but not uh, big uh, using industry well our research process here at our school what will what do we want to do uh, regarding this matter um, well, research what is being done in the storage and production of hydrogen, assess at an experimental level uh, at our laboratory 
uh, the, the combustion or the co-combustion of hydrogen mixed with something else, something, some other fuel like, like uh, LNG or ammonia, who knows, modeling this combustion using some software and processes in different fuel mixtures in what rates it's better to use. Uh, do an economic assessment, uh, a technical level assessment uh, for the introduction uh, of hydrogen as fuel or as fuel fuel mixed with something else uh, for LNG tankers. Uh, it is possible to produce uh, hydrogen with the, the oil of gas that's inside the tanks. So it makes all the sense maybe to mix it with LNG uh, or with ammonia. Uh, get to a certain conclusion, we hope, uh, and some other future research, future research uh, with H2, like modeling, um, like modeling an LNG tanker and uh, then doing what uh, with different fuels. Here in our uh, laboratory, we have a combustion uh, laboratory unit. It's basically a boiler uh, that we, it, it has the possibility to burn different fuels and different, and different mixtures. Uh, we can also do an assessment uh, of uh, the, the, green, the, the gases that is produced on, the, on that combustion and, and see what comes out, uh, if we, we are going in the green way or not. Uh, and this uh, research uh, is being made uh, here in the, our school uh, in partnership with, uh, with INASI, that is from the Universidad de Coruña and uh, ESP Institute of Protecting. But the question is hydrogen a co combustion, a co solution to meet greenhouse gases, those that Timo uh, wants to make it? We don't know, we'll see. We will proceed, we are short in time, but we are going to present another. Uh, presentation the impact of sustainable port activities on the perception of local I uh, no sorry supply chain disruption ever given case study by professor Fernando Cruz Gonçalves Uh, it's a pleasure to be, to be here. Among my presentation, it will be a little bit different. To, I will not present uh, projects uh, that we are involved. We were in Norway, and I think we have Professor Manuel has already made the presentation of Fishy Project, it's a project about developing uh, IT system. Uh, in order to to, to, grade, to the dry wood market, and we decided. I think most of you have, have seen that presentation. We decided to bring another topic. Our main idea is trying to that you cooperate with us in some of the topics that uh, we will present uh, in order to, to make a future work. Instead of presenting uh, uh, projects that we are already involved, the idea is that we could make future work in the universities of Norway, also from the Union. We are always open to partnerships. We believe that these partnerships are very important. Uh, we are from the, the transport and management area in the, the, the Nautical School. There was a topic that was very important, I think you all agree with me. Between 23 and 29 of March 2021, uh, the ever-given vessel had uh, ground in the Suez Canal, and I think the, the international trade stops for being six days. So, uh, and I think it was uh, uh, a mark because why? Because it to show to the world that the maritime transport is very, very important 
and the world has stopped during six days. 12% of the international trade passes by Suez Canal. And uh, during those six days, it was the first time that we had a user accident in the Suez, more than six hours. But during these six days, the world stopped uh, waiting to, for the solution of this, from this problem. At the same time, it shows us that uh, I'm not quite sure about the, the model of development of the shipping vessels. I'm speaking about the size of the vessels. It was a 20,000 20, EU vessel. It's not the biggest vessel in the world. The biggest vessel in the world in the containers has 24,000 TUs. But it shows, as you see, this is this is Swiss Canal. I think this picture is a good picture because it shows the difficult to pass in Swiss Canal. <laughs> Everyone that has to pass in Swiss Canal is already sometimes during the night. And it shows how difficult it is to pass in such a narrow place. Uh, as in, in our school, we have presented a paper about this topic, but we want to make a more holistic, holistic overview about these topics because there are several implications. Okay? The first implication, and I think it's very important for a lot of the schools, the operational aspects about this, this accident. Okay? Uh, the main, it was, uh, we have a, a sandstorm and the, the visibility was very low. And uh, I, I think people that have already passed Suez Canal, we have two pilots from the uh, authority of Suez Canal. We have two pilots on board. And who was in the scene knows that usually we follow the, the orders from the pilots. And they have two, two, two pilots on board and they resolve the visibility was low, they decided to increase the speed in order to make more traction to the vessel. And the idea of increasing speed uh, in, the, in the, a narrow channel uh, then determines the squat effect. And the, the vessel starts going around and around and uh, it grounds. And there are some topics. The first topic is that, that operational question that in my opinion is very important to be studied. And it was very important to try to study this in the, in the simulators in order to avoid in the future these type of situations. And the first is operational. The second question is about legal, legal questions. The captain and the crew was detained. Okay, they say that they were hosted, they were invited. But they were not invited, though they were detained by the Egyptian authorities uh, while the, the, the process was going the, the negotiation. Uh, we have more implications, economic implications. Uh, just to have an idea, and I'm just speaking about the financial depreciation of the, the cargo. It was valued by you with 40. 7,000 million euros, just those six, six days, just the depreciation of cargo. Because the main effect, you know, we have already spoken about this this morning, it was the disruption, supply chain disruption. That they, I think you have the idea today that the world is under chaos. We don't have the goods where they should be. Uh, we have stocks, we don't have, we don't have containers where they should be. We are living in the logistic scales in, our, in this moment. Okay, this is, was one of the reasons, it was not the only one, but this was one of the reasons for, uh, for that, for the supply chain, supply chain uh, disruptions. And we are living at the same time. I'm trying to, 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 to present some topics that for us at least were important to make a deeper analysis. We have already presented, I've told you, we have already presented a, a, a paper about this topic, but it's of one of these questions, I think, uh, it, will, it will be important to, to make a further, a further study. And for example, the optimum size of the vessel, I think we have reached 
the maximum size of the vessel. Okay. Uh, I, I could not prove that, but uh, I don't see any more uh, uh, orders of vessels with more than 24,000 TU vessels. I think at the same time that the shore infrastructure didn't uh, have the same progress that we have on the sea. That's why in this moment the, the shore infrastructures are not designed for the, 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 the size of the vessels that we have that we have built. Uh, at the same time, I think you know, one of the biggest problems about the supply chain with Russia is about the transfers of the cargo between the vessels and shore. The vessels are so big that we could not transfer the cargo from the vessels to shore in a, uh, with a, uh, it's more than two days. Uh, and the, the vessels increase on breast, not on uh, overall, overall, overall weight, weight, which means that we could not put, put more, more gas grades. It was far easy if, if, okay, the vessel increase, then we use more gas grades. But it's not like that. Because the, the type of evolution that we have seen in the, in the vessels are, are, are different than uh, we, could, we could expect it. And uh, at the same time, I think some of you still study the supply chains, speaking about just-in-time models in the supply chain. And in our days, the just-in-model, just-in-time supply chain models are completely out of date because we need to have stocks, because we do not predict the, the replenishment uh, of the stocks. So we, have, we are passing from a model just in time to a model just in case. And I think most of the people didn't realize quite well that's why we have stock, or we, we have a, uh, I could also speak about the chips and so on, but uh, most of the factories don't have stocks in order to, 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 to assure the normal production because we are we we still live in a model that it was from the 90s and uh, uh, that was based on low level of stocks and we are passing we are passing for for different times uh, you could say okay that's very important uh, yes that's that's very important uh, the speed of the the transit time and so on, but the vessels go on so speed. The vessels today uh, uh, sail at half of the speed that they could get. If it was so important the time, like for just in time models, the vessel would not sail at half of why it's important to put vessels at a high, very high speed if they have to, to wait one week or two weeks in the port in, in order to discharge the containers. So we are facing we are facing a time of completely different uh, models, and I think if there is space to, to to try to try to to think a little bit about that. At the same time, it happens. This is evergreen, evergreen. It's the the four main, main companies represent forty four point six percent of the market. The ten bigger companies represent eighty four. 0.6% of the market. We have in our days uh, the oligopoly in the maritime transport. And these operators have power of the market. And I think that we are not uh, we are not facing that reality in the, the best way because uh, in the past it was not like this. The market was pulverized, but now with merger and acquisitions. 10, 10, 10 operators control 84% of the market. So uh, there are some topics that we think that it's important to, to, uh, to develop. Uh, I think it's, it's also today. Uh, I think yesterday, Shanghai, Shanghai has, has stopped operations. It's the biggest port in the world. Has stopped operations for eight weeks because of the politics of China, politics of zero COVID. And uh, uh, during, during eight weeks, uh, they didn't operate. Uh, now, yesterday, they've started operating again. 
I think, but the problem is not now because they will take more or less seven weeks to reach the, the cargo from the China to, to go to the America or to Europe. So, uh, but next seven weeks from now, we will have again very important problems of port congestion like we have in the past. So these types, they are okay. It's just the idea is trying to, to pass some ideas that we are we are we want partners to, to study when each of these topics and uh, to produce some papers uh, in order to, to for for international international conference. And finally, and I we have already spoken about this this morning. I think it will be important that you have two universities, we have the nautical school. Uh, it was maybe we could make a conference, a joint conference, international joint conference, one day, one day in Portugal, one year in Portugal, one day, one year in uh, Norway, in order to, to promote this. I sometimes, I, I, we now are together, but uh, sometimes I feel that we lose contact and then we don't, we don't collaborate and make the cooperation that it would be. But in, and it's, it, is, it is not enough just the Portuguese the nautical school. It is necessary to have two or three more partners to start uh, or to make the organization of, for example, a, a conference like the international conference. You know, call for papers for our students, for your students. And I think to start thinking about to, uh, some to, to, to deeper this idea. Okay, take it out. Thank you very much, Professor Dan Gustavo. And now we are going to the last uh, presentation. Uh, it will be made by video conference because Professor Vitor Caldirinha is not possible to be here. So the title of the presentation is the impact of sustainable part practices on the perception of local communities, and will be presented by Professor Vitor Caldiri. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to all. Uh, so, starting quickly the, the presentation, uh, the goal of the, this research that I'm presenting is to understand the economic, social, and environment sustainable port practices that influence the perception of port communities. So we define and measure a sustainable port practice in one hand, and then we measured the perception of local communities. Uh, this is because it's very important to understand how can a port uh, have the, the approval of local communities to to operate and to expand. So uh, we also saw a very important uh, uh, issue that we verify a moderate influence of the characteristics of the region and the port clusters, as we will see in the in the end in, in the conclusions. So local communities have uh, significantly. Uh, change perceptions about ports and industry as contributors to global warming and the destruction of natural values. So ports are not uh, today are, are seen uh, in, in many places as a bad thing, something that is destroying the nature values. And uh, also the growth of, of cargo volumes and uh, ships and uh, traffic led to the need of more expansion and more and more expansion and congestion in sea in land and that also contributes and increase the negative perception of local communities there is a problem between uh, local communities the cities and the ports so a positive perception of local communities facilitates the social license to operate and expand and this, it is becoming a, a really a competitive advantage for some ports that has this uh, positive Im uh, image, this positive uh, uh, perception by local communities. So 
we, we studied the, the, the literature, scientific literature, and only focus on sustainable port practice in general, not uh, studying the effect of uh, uh, sustainable port practice in the perception of different local communities and what are the most important uh, effective uh, port practice that influence port local communities perception so how can ports do something to influence the local communities perception and have the support of these local communities perceptions the focus of the analysis was this practice this port practice and influence the positive perception of, of this to ensure competitive advantage, sustainable development of the port, and port economic, social, and enrollment contribution for, for the region. The goals were to define relevant sustainable port practice variables and constructs, measure these constructs and the impact of these constructs on the perception, and verify the influence of the region and the port cluster on, in all these models. So we, we built a model, uh, a research model, uh, that includes, in one end, the independent variables that are the, the sustainable port practice, social, sustainable, uh, social communication, social participation, economic port practice, and development port practice. And these practices, mm -hmm. we, we think and we... we uh, we set the hypothesis that influence the local community perceptions. We also had another hypothesis that the characteristic, the characteristics of the region and the port cluster, uh, moderate change the values of this of this model. So let's see what happened in this research. Uh, we we start choosing the the, the variables for the independent the dependent values, how to measure local communities perception. We set uh, seven dependent val uh, variables. Uh, what are the perception of port benefits, port risk, trust in the harbor, uh, port and region relation, port acception, acceptance, uh, trust in port companies, importance of port for, for the local communities. And then uh, we, we, we have also choose 30 in the independent from the literature, independent observed values. Uh, Considering first uh, the involvement practices, like uh, for example, reducing the pollution impacts, uh, uh, collecting uh, ship and, and uh, maritime uh, waste, uh, uh, add, uh, reduce the, tr the truck traffic jams, uh, uh, so involvement certification and different uh, uh, variables on this issue. Then uh, we choose uh, variables on social practice, port communication, uh, port communication with the, uh, in the social networks, newspapers, the, uh, res promoting research with universities, uh, uh, offering training, uh, port training uh, to students and other, other types of communication. Then uh, uh, regional participation in port management and other social practice. So how can uh, local communities participate in port management, participate directly or monitoring the operations and the investments or participation, participating in the port or, for example, a contract between the port and the city for the development. And then also, in the end, economic port practices. Uh, like investing in waterfronts for populations, investing in tur nautical tourism and fishing, investing in sport, cultural and development initiatives and others. Then we, we, we collect data from uh, a sample of five largest Portuguese ports and we received 256 valid answers for the port of Leixões, Aveiro, Lisbon, Setúbal and Sines. And we use uh, the methodology of the structural equation modeling, uh, that is a, a, a confirmatory uh, statistic analysis. So we had uh, the results show that all the, the variables uh, measured uh, by a Likert 7 scale uh, were uh, higher than 4, that, that, that was uh, the variables were important. 
and the main variables with the main scores were uh, pollution reduction, sea uh, ship waste collect, pollution control, pollution transparency, sustainable plan vision and development certification. So pollution is a very important uh, concern for the local populations. And what are the results in the general model? Uh, for, the, the most important uh, issue that influences local communities' perception is control of uh, pollution uh, and all the impacts of the port in the region. So this is the main factor. This is what matters for the port communities, for the local communities. Then the communication with the region. The others, region participation in port management and port investment in the region are not so important in general in Portugal. Okay. But let, let us see by port. There are different results by port because in Leixões, the most important is it is not the control of the impact of the port in the region, but the region participation in port management. People want to participate in port management, also the control of the impact and the communication, but they don't want the port to invest in the region. I don't know. So we try to explain, but... Uh, it, it's not easy, but it's it's different from the other ports like Aveiro, where the most important are uh, port investment in the region uh, development, because there are a different tradition of the port investing in the in the region, different from the Leixões port, and also the control of the impact and the region participation in port management. Here, in this port, uh, the region wants to participate in the port management. Uh, another in Stubal. Uh, the control of the impact of the port is the most important. The others are not important. So the, the, main, the main concern is the, the pollution and the impact of the port. Uh, the, in Lisboa, uh, the, the control of the impact is very important and the others are also important, but with the less, less punctuation, uh, communication with the, re with the region and the port investment in the region development. And then Sines, that is a big transshipment port in the south, the main is the control of the impact of the port in the region, okay, and but also the communication with the region. It's very, it's very important. The others are not so important. Port investment in the region, it's all also important. Uh, so conclusions: the characteristics of the region and the port cluster affect how local communities communities react to different sustainable port practice so ports cannot use the same uh, measures in all all the ports and all the countries depends on the history of the port on the region depends on a lot of of variables about the region and the ports. <coughs> communication financing local initiatives consulting consultation of local communities and ensure the participation of local communities are important uh, sustainable outreach practice but the main the main practices are prevention of port pollution transparency waste management and recycling so these are the most important port sustainable practice for local communities but depends on the port that was a, a important conclusion this study is uh, will be published in the i think in next month in uh, in, in maritime economics and logistic uh, the journal. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Peter Caldirinha, and I hope you recover fast. Thank you. So, this concludes our long seminar. I believe that was a long seminar, but I think that was very interesting for 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 all the people. I think that. Have expressed some of the research and the development that we have in our, in our institution, of course, in cooperation with other institutions like the SCF and, and the NTNU. And I think that we'll have some possible areas of cooperation in the future. We, I know that we have some perspectives of cooperation, and I believe that. Uh, we can open in the near future some others uh, because, of course, we are very interested in cooperating with other institutions uh, like the ones that are presented here. So, the 
some final notes. Uh, we have a dinner reception dinner nearby the, the institution. It's just whether we need to here at 10 o'clock. Um, we don't have too much time, but we, we have some time for rest a little bit and uh, put in order some, some other materials that we are doing uh, to do. Uh, you can, our, our colleagues from Norway can, can use this room for rest a little bit. Yeah. Before eight, we can uh, go to the restaurant. Uh, I ask the colleagues uh, that participate in the meeting are also invited to participate in the dinner. Of course, they are not obliged, but if you want to participate, of course, are welcome. Um, and tomorrow we'll have another day uh, of work. Um, thank you very much for your presence. Just for finish, I would like to uh, all the participants in the seminar of the day can to take a picture, a photo uh, of the group. Okay? Thank you.